Okay, so cool. So your Denzel stuff? Before we get into the Denzel stuff, I just want to say one more thing about The Last Jedi, okay? I rewatched it recently. I sat there and I was I was I was paying attention, like how long is the cancel by stuff? At most, it's like 20, 25 minutes of a two hour, two and a half hour movie. It does not take long at all. It also is really good. It also says a lot about the arc of the movie and about like the kind of themes of what Ron Johnson talks about. Also, that beginning part with the bombers where you know Kelly Marie Tran's sister, uh, I forget her name, not Rose's sister. Uh, you know, she's in the bomber and she falls and she pushed the button and you see her face as the bombs fall and she blows up. You remember that part? Yes, I need to watch them. I ain't watched the movie since we watched it, but I, need, but I, I know what you're talking about. It's, Nate, rewatch the movie. It is so great. Um, but that part, it, 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 you know, people always talk about, oh, Rogue One is the one that really did something different. No, it's not. Nobody can tell you in a single character's name. That's not a good movie. All right. <laughs> I, I, the, the, my, there's, a, there's a nigga who, who I follow who follow me he be talking about movies all the time cool and every so often he be like I don't care what people like The Last Jedi I love Rogue One and I'm always I'm always like right on the edge of being like nigga that movie fucking sucks alright but that's fine he can like what he wants it looks pretty and people be like but look at it it's so grim and dark it's like yeah cause you can't see shit I'm sorry let me keep it moving I like Rogue One I like that everybody I like the bleakness of it that everybody's like, but and they know that they're gonna die. Ain't bleak though, it's lazy movie. Bro. Everybody dies. Name me a character's name, bro. Who's a character in that movie? Rogue One. Name one. Bro, I'm saying Rogue One. That's 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 the that's the call sign for the for the uh the mission. Exactly. What's the who's the, who's the character though? I can name you actors, and I can name you Gene Rogue. Gene Rogue. I don't think you know who you're talking about, but uh, <laughs> I know I know some of their names because I know Star Wars and I'm just familiar with it, but like. Bro, it's 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 not even as bad. It's like it's fine, but people elevate it to a point where I'm like, it's not that good, guys. It's it's perfectly good movie. The thing about the Last Jedi is it talks about the the kind of like various pockets that happen when you have like a big war and resistance type deal, and then you also have at the center of it a story about storytelling, about like perspective and all these things. And to me, as a person who loves the Revenge of the Sith. That movie taps into what I really love about Revenge of the Sith. The moment where uh, fucking Obi Wan is like, you know, uh, you know, Anakin, the Chancellor is evil, and then you know, Anakin says, Obi Wan says to Anakin that, and Anakin says, from my point of view, the Jedi are evil, you know, and and the Last Jedi is all about point of view and perspective. Kylo Ren is only who Kylo Ren is because from his point of view, Luke tried to kill him, and Luke is only feels as much of a failure as he is because from his point of view. He let himself and Kylo Ren down by having a moment of doubt. And then by the end of the movie, he has come around to say that doubt was only a mistake and we can move past this. I will not be the last Jedi because it does not matter. There's an amazing moment that I forgot about in the in Revenge of the not Revenge of the Sith, in The Last Jedi, where Luke explicitly references the prequel movies, you know, the Phantom Menace, uh, Attack of the Clones, and Revenge of the Sith. He says he says to Ray, when he's teaching her the lessons, he says, the problem with the Jedi was that they they had they had vanity. To assume that the the light is synonymous with the Jedi makes it so that that you feel like that you have to exist and that your all your choices are correct. He was saying like the Jedi was wrong. Like Anakin Anakin shouldn't have been afraid to love Padme out loud. And if he was allowed to be with Padme in public, he wouldn't have become Darth Vader. But because of the Jedi strict rules and like we're the good guys, you have to do what we say. That led him to the path of the dark side. He couldn't trust nobody. And then and Luke basically says, like, that's vanity. We can't believe that. Just because the Jedi is here or they're not here does not mean the light goes away. The light can exist even if the Jedi don't. That's why he thinks the Jedi should not exist, because they are only focused on dogma and, like, strict rules and not about the kind of inherent nature of what the light uh, brings about and what the Force is. Anyway, I think the last Jedi rules. I, I will say this. One point of contention is that you know, the whole Snoke thing. But then I saw somebody say, oh, no, you know, because of the point of contention that they killed off their the, the main villain like that, and it, it was like, it was like anticlimactic. But and then somebody was like, he's not the main villain. It's still Kylo Ren. And, they, and, and people was like, he's one of them. And I'm like, but if but he's not the main one, obviously, it's still Kylo Ren. Uh, that, that's more of a MacGuffin than anything, right? Uh, and also, I forgot the other point of contention. Um, was that oh that what you just talking about? How like you did all this stuff with Luke, and then by the end he's back to where he was. So 
what was the point of making him this like snotty bratish dude who 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 throws the lightsaber? You did all this stuff and made him so unlikable just to kind of bring him around full circle again. And that's another point that people uh, talk about when they be like, "Yeah, I, I hate that. I hate what they did to Luke Skywalker in that movie." But but the, the idea of like, but he's now back to where he was at the end of Jedi is such a silly notion because if even if you have like any passing knowledge of like human nature or humanity or age in general is that. As people age, they become more cynical, they become less idealistic. And the thing with, with him is like he needed Ray to come and show him that this stuff still matters. Like he, like the point with Luke is like, yo, fuck them stories, bro. Like all that shit with Vader, it didn't matter because I, I fucked up and now I'm stuck on this island because I didn't do the work I should have done. And Ray's like, no, Luke, you 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 redeemed Vader. You saved the galaxy. These stuff, this stuff matters. There's a beautiful moment where uh where Luke goes on the Falcon for the first time after uh, he realizes Han died, right? And then he, he sees R2. And he's like, R2, you know, they hug and stuff and they catch up. And then he's like, R2, I can't go back. Like, there's nothing for me there. And then R2 plays the shot from uh, the first movie, you know, the, the Princess Leia thing where, you know, help me, Obi-Wan, you're my only hope. You know what I'm talking about? The message? Yeah. yeah. And he's like, that's a sneaky one, R2. But I think that the movie is pointing towards, like, I think pe- uh, people people weirdly get this idea that that movie is cynical about Star Wars and it's telling you to let the past die. And, you know, like that's weird because the movie, the people who say let the past die are the bad guys. Kyle Ren literally tells him, let Leia die, let Poe and Finn and all of them die. It doesn't matter. You can be with me. We can be the future. Her point is like, I can't let it die. This stuff matters and I need to honor it in some way. And that's why she doesn't go with Kylo. And that's why at the end he becomes that person again. He's like, I'm re-energizing this and like these stories, it reaffirms everything, you know? I I just think ugh, I think that movie is so smart and so good. But anyway, we can move on. I just keep rambling about the last show though. Mm-hmm. Obviously it's not it's not perfect, right? I'm not gonna argue that, but I think it has a lot more on its mind than people get it credit for. And because they have these kind of ideas of like, well, this is not what I want out of Star Wars, this is not what I like. I want my characters to do this, this, and that. They're they're silly, you know. They're the kind of people who watch stuff like, you know, Clone Wars and Rebels because they only care about plot stuff. They don't care about ideas or anything like that. I watched um, I watched a clip from The Mandalorian today, and uh, and and then I watched Marnie, right? And I was watching Marnie, the, the Hitchcock movie, and I was thinking, like, this is so elegantly directed. He is so patient. He allows quiet. There's, there's moments in that, in that movie that are so tense because he just has no music and all you hear is footsteps. It's amazing. And then you watch The Mandalorian, and they keep cutting into stuff that does not need to be cut into. I was just like, this is so terribly assembled. It's so but people don't care because they don't because they don't care about like the elegance of the filmmaking or the they what they care about is like the plot beats and like does it give me what I want? Is it show Ahsoka with her lightsabers being the badass? That's all that matters. And it's not about like how it looks or what it's trying to say or what it's getting across. Because it's all just I don't know. I, uh, people said that season finale was amazing. Huh? Yeah, because Luke Skywalker shows up, and he and he, and it's Luke Skywalker right after Revenge of the Return of the Jedi. He got his green lightsaber, and he's slicing niggas up. That's why. Oh, really? He looked young and everything. He does. I mean, it's computer generated. It looks really fake, but he shows up, and it, 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 basically, like they're all like. In uh, uh, he he ended all black with that green saber. Was crazy though. Yeah, he do. He, that fit is crazy. I will say. I do, I do be, I still be like, yeah, what the fuck happened to the green saber? Everybody worry about that blue one. <laughs> they may had a whole. Yeah, one like, and the green on. saber, something go different. Something go crazy about that green saber. Niggas like, I, I like blue. I'm like, nah, nigga, that green hit. I like, Everybody I like, got I like green. Everybody got a blue. I'm like, I like green, bro. That's why. I like that's green. why base was cool to me because he had purple. I ain't seen nobody with purple. And he only got that because Sam Jackson was like, if I'm gonna be in Star Wars, I want a purple lightsaber. And George was like, all right, sure. I like fun. I mean, it don't matter to me. And then I started doing the yellows and the lights. It was all that kind so, of lightsaber was dope, though. I watched like that clip of the Mandalorian, Ahsoka Tano. She has two lightsabers, and they're white. They look dope as hell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's crazy. That's have, crazy. have you seen that picture of them with uh, Rosario Dawson? I, I saw the Rosario Dawson stuff when that happened. Yeah, but that those those lightsabers, I'm like, yo, man, I ain't never seen a white one before. I just, I just don't. I thought I was going to care about that show, but then, I don't know. I just, like, I, well, first of all, I don't care to, like, get Disney Plus, but also, I just, I, like, I don't know. I don't care. I mean, like, people love it, but to me, it's all the stuff that, like, I just, I'm just at a point where I'm like, I don't care about plot shit. Like, 
the people the people who like that show were like, oh, you know, it's, it connects this and that. I'm like, I don't give a fuck about that. Like, I just want to, you know, I don't. That's why I like the Last Jedi because it's like, well, that's not Luke I know. I'm like, okay, so <laughs> your, your baby. The whole thing. <laughs> man, man. That's not the Luke. I know. That's they said that man can't change in 30 years, and that ain't realistic. Yo, these niggas said, this man said consistent character. I'm like, you realize Captain America is the same person from 1940 to fucking his death? Like, he never changes. That's the most boring. Like, I love Captain America. I love the fact he doesn't change, but don't act like that's the one you like. He's the guy. That's the one you need to model it after. I'm like, no, he's he like, that's why the people care so much. I, well, that ain't why they care so much. Honestly, I'm kind of disappointed they didn't let Chris Evans drop a, a, a colored here and there or something. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> he when, he, said like, like when he met Falcon that. for the first time, he's like, like oh, colored folks working here, huh? Like, huh? But when he met uh, Fury. <laughs> hey, or something, just, I didn't know y'all let blacks run the asylum. Because I'm like, he from New York. He might not say nigga. But, and, and, you know, he'll probably throw a colored or a Negro in there somewhere. I'm like, let, let him drop one of them. Come on, y'all. Let's be real out here. Let somebody call him out. I'm be honest. He's the reason why I hate that first wave of Avengers. I hated him so much. He's so good in that first Avengers movie, though. No, I'm, I'm talking about like the, the whole thing. That's why I couldn't. I can't. Like I liked Iron Man. I did not like Captain America at all. I thought he, I think, and I hated how he was so much stronger than everybody else. But he's, I so, just, good. I, he's so good, though. I, like you remember on um, I think Infinity War the best movie by far of the Marvel movies. Disagree. Yeah, yeah, no, no, like yeah, well that. I, when he was running by the Black Panther, like I, I didn't mind it as much, but I, it was silly. I'm talking about like when he was holding Thanos's hand, like only, and then like and like kind of like staying there. I'm like, niggas, you, you just really strong. You're not that nigga though. If everybody else get knocked around, yo ass with it. I ain't like that at all. I just I hate Captain America so much, and I'm glad I'm glad he's a, I'm glad his story is done because I don't I never want to see his, him in a movie again. I like I like I love Chris Evans in that role because I think he plays it so perfectly, and I love I love the character of Captain America. Period. Right. I just think like, my, I mean, like I said, the biggest problem with all those movies is just they don't take the time to be like, how do these people feel about the choices they've made? You know, my least favorite thing about Infinity War is that it starts and like Captain America is already in a foreign nation, and we don't get to see him react to like, yeah, I just fought my best friends, and now I'm on the run from the country that I defended you know 60 70 years ago what does that say about me and what do i represent you know and i'm like i would have loved to have like a whole you wanted you wanted the cinema part of the movie that scorsese says is missing but i mean that it's not even that because they have pathos. no that's it but in some of their movies they have real pathos to it it's just like that was a big like civil war is a big choice to make right even though that movie is nothing and about nothing it still is a big thing that he made that choice to fight uh, Iron Man and all that stuff. And then we just gloss over because now Thanos is here and there's bigger stuff to fry and we don't really have to deal with it. Now, now I've heard they talk about it in Endgame, but I haven't seen Endgame. I really want you to watch that Thomas Flight video. All right, I'll, I'll tap into it at one point. I, I don't. I disagree that it's not cinema. I, I think... I think cinema can be all sorts of things like, you know... Well, TV ain't cinema, so that ain't nothing crazy to say. I mean, I mean look... I no know. TV is cinema. I can load Succession all day. It ain't, and, and he says it. He was like, he, and Scorsese, it's, it's in that video, and it's the reason why I crystallize it so much now, because Scorsese was like, I, he said, I thought at one point long form TV was cinema. He said, it's not. It's something else. It doesn't make it worse, but it's not that because it's like, you, you can watch it before you can do all these things. You can watch it and you can watch three episodes, five, seven. He said, it's not the same. It don't make it any better or worse, but it ain't cinema. And I was like, yeah, and I mean, it's worse. And he, and he, called, and, and he called Marvel movies like, uh, Roller coaster movies. You know, like people like roller coasters, and they're very fun. I I love a good roller coaster, so mm-hmm. it ain't a bad thing. Yeah, I just I agree wholeheartedly with that sentence. I don't know. There's been a lot of conversation recently about it because you know film critics are doing best of the year lists and they're trying to see whether or not Small X is a television show or a series of movies. And some people and some sites have been like, no, Small X are a series of movies, and we we rate them on our top whatever because they're movies, you know? And some people are like, no, that's television, because it's it, it wasn't in a the theater. It was intended as, like, to be as a piece together, you know? And, you know, and somebody was funny. It was like, look, cinema's everything I like, and everything I don't like ain't cinema. I was like, yeah, that's fair. And I was like, no. Nah. That's funny. You, you can say that you mark, but I'm not. I'll tell you that person I, you I'm mark. Just saying, I'm just saying, like, you know, 
who knows? It's a it's a silly su- subject to get stuck on. I'm, I'm gonna listen to Scorsese over all of those quote unquote critics because they don't know as much as he do about I, the movies. I, I just think Marvel. <laughs> That's why Marvel is definitely it. cinema. There are movies, there are Marvel movies that are not Marvel. Movies, there are movies that are less that are less uh, like uh, emotionally sophisticated that we consider cinema. You know, so. But that, but one they of work, the, it, it ain't about emotional. It ain't about emotional sophistication. But it's I think more it, takes about, a, it takes a very specific set of skills, and it's very difficult to make a good. A good well, 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 hold on. It's it's more about uh, which one is being highlighted, and basically one of the. And I want you to watch the Thomas Hart video because out of context, it don't sound. It might not sound as good. But one of the points he was because he used examples from uh, Infinity. Uh, he used examples from Marvel movies and then regular movies, and he basically was saying like the movie like. The 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 big points of other movies are the emotional beats and like the things that are happening inside a person that changes them or makes them feel something. Whereas the, the Marvel movies has some of those, but those are one. Those are not what are being uh, highlighted the most. It's the big action set pieces, which is fine. But the the other movies, like a Taxi Driver or something, those movies are moved by the emotion of the characters. Those make the movie. Whereas Marvel movies are made. And live and die by their action pieces. And yes, they do have like great emotional moments, but those are so rarely, if if never, highlighted that those can't be cinema. Basically, is what the the video is saying. See, and I agree. Mm, see, I, I disagree with that because there are movies that are purely based that are like hollow in terms of emotional, like like that where the characters are hollow characterizations and the motion isn't like super in depth, but that is pure and aesthetic uh, exercise. And that's where the power comes from in the filmmaking. So but like, it's also a movie that you know. It's, it's just, yeah, it's, but like if you watch fucking, I don't know. If if you watch say, yo, I just had something. What did I do? If you watch because, Batman, it, because even a, a movie, movie like, like Max Fury Road, its power just comes from. Say. That also has the emotion that he's uh, talking about. But but I'm saying the power of that movie doesn't come from the emotion. It comes specifically from the kind of like aesthetic overload of the film. And like if that movie wasn't, if that movie was the same but less, but not as well made, then it's not on the same level. The what what elevates it is like how overwhelming it is away from like pure emotion. Like I I, I disagree. I think that movie is all about the emotion, which is which sets up the entire need for them to be on the run so much because it's about women and, and their fight to not be oppressed, things of that nature. I think that the I think the very essence of that movie is about but what those movies, characters are going through. Well, I, I, I think the very essence of the movie is what the characters are going through. It just so happens that they're being chased across the desert for most of it. But there's not dismissing those points at all. And a lot of the movie is is, is those big heavy moments when they're talking about those things. And it, it ain't just Marvel where it's just, you know, a bunch of explosions. And then one scene where um, Hawkeye and Black Widow had that fight. And then it's gone. I'm like, oh, yeah, I threw her off a cliff. Now we're going to move on. It ain't like that. So, mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I, I just think it's different. And I think it's not cinema, which is fine. And a lot of people like those movies. And that's great. I like some of them. But it ain't it ain't Taxi Driver. It ain't Francis Ha. It ain't Her. It ain't, uh you know, Casino. It ain't none of those movies. And it's fine. This guy. Sound like a snob to me. I mean, you call me that. I just like good movies. I don't know what y'all watch. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but what was your Denzel thing? Okay, so I'm listening to Blank Check, right? And they're doing a miniseries on Robert Zemeckis. So they to, the one they released today was on the movie Flight, you know, starring Denzel. That's one I really want to see that, by the way. Yeah, I haven't seen that either. It's on Hulu, and that's one from the last 10 years I haven't seen. And they talked about how amazing Denzel is. So uh, one of them made the point, he's like, Denzel may be the best movie star of his generation. It'd be like, it's between him and George Clooney. And the other one was like, um, not only is he the best movie star of his generation, he may be the best movie star ever, where it's like any movie he's in, he takes it immediately to like a six out of 10, no matter what it's about. That's how good he is and everything. Like effortlessly good. And I was thinking about this, um, you know, you, you talked about the Kevin stage thing and all that. But, like, you've seen Phantom Threat recently, right? Yes. The reason why I don't put much stock into that idea of, like, well, Denzel plays the same character every role, I never see him fall into the role. Daniel Day-Lewis plays different types of people. 
in movies, right? Very different. You know, he puts on accents and stuff, but there are very specific things that I recognize in a Daniel Day Lewis performance. Like the way he lowers his eyes when he's angry, the way he smacks his teeth. You know what I'm saying? If you watch Reynolds Woodcock and then you watch Daniel Plainview from there, will be oh, you're saying he does the same thing, just in different like bodies. It's, it's, it's just that he, he instead of in one he he stands up straight and the other he slouches and he has different dress and he wears his hair different. He styles differently, and that's you know that's what every movie does. But specifically for him, I think I think it, I think there are things that in Daniel Day Lewis's performances that I'm like I like that about what he always does because he does always do. That's a great things. point. He does. Like, if you watch, like, think about the way he snaps at Cyril in Phantom Thread, and think about that in regard to how he snaps at, like, Paul Dano and There Will Be Blood. It's less hostile and less, like, you know, murderous, but it's a very similar, like, facial expression. Well, I guess because it's still the same person, no matter how much you try to be somebody else. Exactly. And people, and what people latch onto is that, like, the big movies, they're like, oh, you know, the training day, he's always doing that type of thing, that kind of, like, grinning charismatic movie star thing. I'm like, he's not though. You know, he plays pockets of that kind of emotion. Um, and I was thinking about uh, oh, you know what's crazy, but uh, not to cut you off, but somebody in that video, but the Kevin State video had mentioned flight and, sh- and Angel Lakita Moore was like, that's one of like, that's one of my my favorite Denzel from because he's not doing the same thing. But you're making the point that he uh, everybody kind of does the same thing. Everybody does. <laughs> And like, even if you say Daniel Day Lewis is the most transformative actor in in, in history, the, I I can point to very specific things he does across his entire career that nobody else does other than him. Like, I, you watch Age of Innocence from '93, and there's a straight line you can draw to like Reynolds Woodcock and Phantom Thread in in 07, 2017. It's very similar, not very similar performances, but they're in the same range, and you can see the like progression of like what he's doing as an actor. It's very the process is very similar. Um, but also one thing I want to say is also this, they were talking about him as a movie star and all this stuff. And I was thinking like Denzel has had guys who have made movies specifically for him throughout his entire career in like a really amazing way. You know, he had obviously the big ones like Spike and Anton Fuqua, which are like probably the biggest ones that people know. But, you know, he also had Tony Scott, which made like, they made like 10 movies together. And then he had like Carl Franklin who made two or three movies together. And he had Jonathan Demme and they made two movies together. Like he's he's had people who had who was able to showcase who one loved Denzel Washington because he's one of our great actors, uh, but also they're able they know what he can do and they're right for him specific weird pockets of pockets things. You talked about the girl on Kevin on stage. She talked about um that Jeffrey Wright is an actor she really likes. She said that that's her favorite because he you you can't tell it's him in every movie. Well, which I which I definitely thought about I was like no nah, you, you can't. Je- so Jeffrey Wright has a small role in the Manchurian Candidate, the Jonathan Demme version, and the, and him and Denzel have a scene together that's amazing and it's really tense and like not scary, but it's very like it makes you it's unnerving. Um, Jeffrey Wright plays like a mentally unstable person. Um, in it, regardless, all that stuff wraps around and and means something in the end. But like, you know. You watch Inside Man, and then you watch Malcolm X, and you watch Glory, and you watch uh, He Got Game, and all these other things. There's a there's a pocket of Denzel that he fits comfortably in, you know, that he works in consistently. That that he's probably most known for, which is the movie star, like charismatic Denzel. But he also has these other like ways in which he kind of slides into the movies and into roles that is really fascinating. And I think like, you know, a, a performance like Inside Man is like maybe one of the best performances of the 21st century, his performance in that. And like, you know, people don't give it a lot of credit. One, because it's, you know, just a heist movie, but also uh, it's kind of a populist movie. It's a huge hit. So it, it, it's a weird thing to talk about. Also, that, that in regards to a lot more people are seeing Tenet now and are talking about Tenet. You know, they're, they're criticizing this, that, and the other. I saw someone online say, um, she was like, you know, is there any reason to watch Tenet when like Deja Vu and the Matrix trilogy exists? And I was thinking about it like this, and I was like, I know that uh, Christopher Nolan is a big Tony Scott fan. He, lo- you know, he loves Unstoppable like Tarantino loves it, right? And I was thinking like, you know, Nolan has never worked with Denzel, but I do think there's a pointed thing. I- okay, so so Tony Scott and Denzel made the movie uh, Deja Vu, which is a sci-fi movie about. Going back in time or something, I don't know what it's about, but 
He made in 06. People I trust online have said it's one of the greatest movies of the 21st century and it's one of the most brilliant sci-fi films ever made. I've never seen it, and I probably will soon. But that movie feels like, you know, Nolan trying to make an equivalent of that with Tenet. And he's like, I, I'm, you know, Denzel's too old. He's not the guy I want. I'm going to get Denzel's son in the same way because, you know, Nolan is very much a fan of Tony Scott and is emulating him in a lot of ways in the same way he emulates Ridley and Stanley Kubrick and all these guys. And, you know, Tenet can be seen as, you know, a kind of Nolan-esque version of what Tony Scott was doing in the mid to late 2000s with, like, Unstoppable and Taking a Foul on 1, 2, 3 and uh, Out of Time and Deja Vu, just all the stuff he did with Denzel. I mean, they, they made movies in the 90s, too, Crimson Tide, I believe. But I just think... For whatever reason, we overlook Denzel's career and 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 overlook like the vi- the vast amount of work he's done with with amazing filmmakers, like some of the best of all time. Like I said, you know Demi Scott, so like Lee, Spike Lee, and I think you know Denzel kind of these days. I think the last maybe not great filmmaker, but pretty good filmmaker he works with consistently is now just Anton Fuqua. It seems he don't really work with much. He works with other people, but just not like as consistently. Um. But that's all I want to say. Well, you got that movie that he's directing, uh, hopefully coming out at some point. I mean, Denzel, Denzel, they talked about that too. Like, Denzel's a good director. He's made three movies, and all of them are good to great. He made the Anton Fisher, The Great Debaters, and Fences. Those are the only movies he's directed. And, uh, yeah. You know, shout out to him. Fences, fantastic. So I had something I wanted to go through before we get to our top list of the decade. Um, yeah, Indy Wire had put out their top back in last year. Last, last year. year, and I, I'm not going through every one because it's a lot. I just had a few that I wanted to get your your thoughts on uh, throughout this 100. Uh, the number 100, speaking enough, was Paul Thomas Anderson's Inherent Vice. Great movie. <laughs> Is that too low or what? I don't know. To you, it's, I don't know. It's in my top hundred that I put. So, um, let me see here. Before we, before, okay. you, before you talk about it, I'm just gonna say this. I my top fifty is ranked right in terms of like best to worst, and then it's like sixty, like fifty one to like one hundred. I didn't rank them. I just put them in any random order. So those mm-hmm. are just kind of like 50 honorable mentions that like would be the other 50. I just didn't put them in order. And then the top 50 are like 50 to 1. That's, this is how I rank them in terms of the best. And then we go ahead. Um, number 92 was Into the Spider-Verse. Great. Great. Mm-hmm. Number 90 was Private Life, which I really – I mean, number – what's this? Not, yeah, number 90 is Private Life, which I really enjoyed. Fucking, that's a great movie. Number 89 was your movie, Support the Girls. Great movie as well. Um, really going. We love Support the Girls. Uh, number 84 is Beats, Beast of the Southern Wild. Cool. Good movie. Uh, number 81. I ain't got to do that one. That's not important enough. Uh, let me see here. Um, number 75 is A Star is Born. I need to see that. And then number 74 was The Last Jedi that we just talked about. Great. Deserves it. 73 was La La Land. Great. Love it. 72 was The Handmaiden. Great. Too low. Oh, not my thing. I'm going to mess up. You really finna go through this whole list? I'm not going through all of them. Yeah, but you finna go to the top, though? What you mean? You finna, you're going to keep going through the list of, you know, notable ones until you get to, like, top five or whatever? No. Okay. I'm just going to 10. How about that? Hey, do that uh, now, man. Number 11 was Wolf of Wall Street. I thought that was interesting. Great movie. Uh, number 10 was Lady Bird. Cool. Great movie. Number, number 9 was Mad Max Fury Road. Uh, Cool. Number 8 was The Master. Great. Number 7 was Carol. Great. Love it. Number six is Holy Motors. I need to see it. Number five was Inside Lewin Davis. Great. 
Number four was the act of killing slash the look of silence. That's movie I've been meaning to watch since like my freshman year of college. It's been on my list but, for years. By Joshua Oppenheimer. There are two uh, documentaries about. Do you know what they're about? They got a description, but I just went past it. I would say, don't read the description. Just watch the movies. But they're really like fascinating. Go ahead. Number three is certified copy. That's a, that's that movie is so strange. I watched that movie and I was like, I have no idea what this is about. But I I, I, I finished it. and I was like, I like it. But I have no. I, I can't even grasp on any of it. It's so strange to me. Number two is Under the Skin. Good movie, yeah. And number one was Moonlight. Cool. Dig it. All right. Now, I don't have mine in order. I'm just going to tell you now. I'm going to try to get a 10. But I wrote down the movies that I thought should be here. And it's like over 60 some. So, no, nah, it's like 92. 92. So just run down to 50 and then we'll we'll do that. Well, again, they're not in order. They're Is your like top ten in order at least? No. So none of it's in order. <laughs> I know the number one. Okay, okay. Well, well then, run down. I can, I can I can make out a ten, I think. Yeah, if you can, um, at least a ten. R- run down the fifty, and I'll run down my fifty, and then we'll do top fifty. Top fifty. Like, like <laughs> just, just you say you got ninety two. Just read from the bottom of your list until you get to the fifty. And I'll read until I get to 50. But understand that some movies might be higher than where they are. I just put them where I thought of them. That's fine. All right. So do you just want to run through your whole list first? Or what? That, that might be best. Uh, I, I mean, we really don't got time to be, you know, talking about every single one of them. So We ain't going to talk about every single one. Okay. I'm not trying to talk about every single one. No, I'm just I saying. I wrote down the movies that I thought of that I was like, oh, yeah, I enjoyed it. Cool. Okay. Or you, did you want to do yours while I'm trying to see what I got here? Yeah, I can do, I can do the, the honorable mentions, the, you know, the unranked 101 to 51. Go ahead. I only put a 101 because I had no Soderbergh on here. Um, so I put Contagion. I mean, he ain't good. Contagion at 101. No, it's just like, you know, my favorite Soderbergh is like, Early two thousands, late nineties type deal, but um, but I was surprised how many I didn't make the list. You know, Hold the Dark didn't make it, Private Life didn't make it. Those are movies I love. You know what I'm saying? Like there's a whole bunch of movies that didn't make it that I didn't that I love and just didn't make a top one hundred, which I was very surprised about. I was like, this is gonna make a hundred. I was like, nah, didn't do it. Um, movies I haven't seen, like I haven't seen Spotlight yet. I haven't seen Shoplifters. Haven't seen you know Capernaum and so many others. I need to see more of these things. I don't, do I have a ball? This is a fluid list. That's what I was saying. Okay. Well, I'll just run it down. And I'll stop briefly on the thing. Uh, let's see. Contagion, Killing of a Sacred Deer, The Raid Redemption. Should I say the, the date they were made or no? Like the year? If, if you want to. Sure. Contagion, <laughs> 2011. Kill the second year, 2017. The Raid Redemption, 2012. Martha, Marcy, May, Marlene, 2011. The Neon Demon, 2016. Nocturama, 2017. Phoenix, 2015. Widows, 2018. American Honey, 2016. We Need to Talk About Kevin, 2011. Creed, 2015. The Lego Movie, 2014. I got two two there. Two 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 two. The Florida Project, 2017. Why well, put 2011? Fuck, I'm done. That's a weird though. Lady Bird 2017, Knives Out 2019, Booksmart 2019, Dragged Across Concrete 2018, Game Night 2018, Ad Astra 2019, The Immigrant 2013, La La Land 2016, Camera Person 2016, uh, Drinking Buddies 2013, Support the Girls 2018, Star Wars The Last Jedi 2017, Upstream Color 2013, Us 2019, Get Out 2017, Moonlight 2016, Mad Max Fury Road 2015, Selma 2014. I should have put 13th on here. I really fucked up. Uh, Melancholia 2011, Roma 2019, Portrait of a Lady on Fire 2019, A Separation 2011, Baby Driver 2017, Once Upon a Time <laughs> Hollywood 2019, Sicario 2016, Personal Shopper 2017. Shout out Kristen Stewart and Olivia Sias. Love that movie. Uh, Somewhere 2010, shout out Sofia Coppola, her masterpiece. 
Blue is the warmest color, 2013. Duckwater, 2018. The Town, 2010. And Hair and Vice, 2014. Take This Waltz, 2011. Shout out Sarah Polly. She's a genius. She needs to make more movies. Uh, Manchester by the Sea, 2016. Inside Lewin Davis, 2013. Django Unchained, 2012. Stories we, twi- Stories we Tell, 2012. Shout out Sarah Polly again. Amazing documentary. I Am Not Your Negro, 2017. X-Men Days of Futures Past, uh, 2014. Now, X-Men Days of Futures Past also almost made the top 50, but I was like, nah, I bumped it down to 51. But uh, mm-hmm. close. Uh, that's my favorite live-action comic book movie of the last 10 years. It's mm. interesting. Yeah, I love it so much. Yes. So I think I've got a twenty. I'm not confident in it. <laughs> but that, that's fine. Just just read till you get to like. Do you have them numbered at all? I just numbered my twenty. I want to go through the ones that aren't numbered. Yeah, go through, go, go through those. Real quick. Okay, so these these are the ones that aren't numbered, and I don't really I don't know if they're on. I have honorable mentions with like Asterix Bomb. But um, and it's only a few. The rest of the movies I enjoyed, they're just not in the twenty. We'll say the asterisk first, and then go back and do those. So my asterisk is Private Life, The Last Jedi, Don't Breathe, um, This is This is the End, Detroit, War Dogs, Project X, mm-hmm. uh, un- Uncorked, Bright. Um, mm, good job. I like them. Um, The Assistant, End of Watch. Uh, the Assistant from this year. Yes. Does that count for the last decade? No, no, no. The assistant came out last year. It came out early this year. That's 2019, brother. That's 2020, bro. It's 2020, 2019, brother. I looked it up. Okay. When I typed in 2019 movies, it was first. Okay. I'm just letting you know. But uh, I think those are my last. Those are the ones that I have marked as like, I'm putting them there because I, oh, The Nice Guys, Free Fire, and The Gentleman. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, Captain America: Civil War, Avengers: Infinity War. Uh, what other ones do I have a mark by? Ten Cloverfield Lane. Mm. Did I say Detroit? Yeah, you did. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think those are all little marked. Yeah. Oh, and uh, Krisha, uh All About Nina. Good movie. Portrait of Lady on Fire. Yeah, I think those are all the ones that I have marked. I, I didn't have any uh, Marvel or DC on here, but I do I do love Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, Iron Man 3, The First Avengers, Aquaman, um, Birds of Prey, and Yuck. Yeah, Homo was pretty good. So yeah, those movies that didn't make the 100, but I do love them as well. Now I'm going to go through the ones that aren't marked, because um, I got the 20, like I said. And that these do not mean that these are marked. I literally just did this a second ago. These very well could have been in there. In fact, the first one I'm going to say probably should have been Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, uh, Bad Times at El Royale, The Irishman, uh, Fruitvale Station, Black Panther, Mad Max Free Road, Phantom Thread, uh, Inside Lewin Davis, uh, Moonlight, Fences, Baby Driver, Fury, The Hunger Games Trilogy, uh, Gone Girl, Blind Spotting, That Awkward Moment, Widows, The Hateful Eight, uh, did I put that by that one? Ew, no, I gotta change it. Uh, Black Swan. Oh, wait, no. Okay, go ahead. So, Black Swan, uh, Mother, Good Time, uh, Mid 90s, Mank, Last Black Man, Last Black Man in San Francisco. Mank does Black not Man. count. Mank does not count. Oh, yeah, that's right. It come out this shit, didn't it? All right, yeah. I forgot. I just wrote it down. Uh, Last Black Man in San Francisco, Lady Bird, mm. The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, mm. Split. What? I said, mm, I forgot about Buster Scruggs. That's a good one. Split, Ad Astra, The Maze Runner Trilogy, Hell Logan, yeah. Kong Skull Island, Dark Knight Rises, Enemy, Arrival, Sicario, Snowpiercer, Up There, Her, Loose, X-Men First Class, X-Men Days of Future Past, It Follows, uh, Waves, uh, Sorry to Bother You, Us, Ready or Not, Bad Education, Jojo Rabbit, Marriage Story, uh, Maze Runner Trilogy, if I didn't say that already. I think I said that already. You did. Uh, <laughs> and Harry Potter, Deathly Hollows Part 1 and 2. So those are not the ones that I have marked. Okay. With the number. And you have a top 20 now? I have a top 20. All right. So I'm going to do, I'm going to run to 20 and then we'll go from there, okay? 
Gotcha. So these are ranked from 50 to 21. So these are ranked top 50 of the year, or of, of yeah. 2010s for me, that I've seen. It'll, it'll probably change when I watch more, rewatch some others. So 50, Berlin Syndrome, 2017, amazing. 49, Everybody Wants Them, 2016. Um, 48, Jackie, 2016. First Man, uh, 47, 2018. 46, If Bill Street Could Talk, 2018. 45, Margaret, 2011. 44, Boyhood, 2014. 43, Patterson, 2016. 42, I put two movies in there by the same filmmaker. They kind of exist in the same place in my mind. I love them both to death. Lawrence Anyways, 2011, and Mommy, 2014, both by Xavier Dollar. So they're both at 42. And then 41, Fruitvale Station, 2013. Uh, 40, Comet, 2014. 39, Francis Hodge. I thought about that. What, Comet? Yeah, I definitely. I passed it on. Like, oh, I forgot about that movie. Francis Hodge, 2012. 38, uh, one of three horror movies on here. My third favorite horror movie of the last 10 years. Uh, it Comes at Night, 2017, at 38. 37, True Grit, 2010. Um, 36, Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, 2010. 35, Marriage Story, 2019. 34, Anomalisa, 2015. 33, 12 Years a Slave, 2013. 32, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, 2018. 31, Meeks Cutoff, 2011. 30, Silence, 2016. 29, The Nightingale, 2019. Take, uh, 28, Take Shelter, 2011, 27, Black Swan, 2010, uh, 26, my second favorite horror movie of the 2010s, It Follows, 2015, 25, The Master, 2012, uh, 24 is Columbus, 2017, 23 is Chirac, 2015, 22, Dunkirk, 2017, and then 21 is uh, Little Women, 2019. Really? Yeah, love it. What was the last one? Little Women 2019. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course you would. Uh, <laughs> let me see. I'm trying to get them all in order so I don't uh, miss one. You know, I have them in order, but I want to make sure because they're kind of all over the place. But uh, so what you think about your number one? My number one? Yeah. Have you said that yet? I haven't said my number one, no. Oh, okay. What'd you think about the list you just gave? All great movies. I thought I thought I would have more uh, more foreign language joints in here, so I gotta tap in on that. Stop playing around. But, yeah, you do need to stop. Meeks cut off. I'm glad I got <laughs> in there. Love Kelly Reichardt. I should honestly, she needs to be in here more. Certain certain women in night movies should be in the top 100. So some some probably gonna get knocked later on. Um, you know, Mary Stories in there. The only there's only three filmmakers who make my uh, no there's only two filmmakers who make my top fifty t- three times like I have a couple who make it twice and I have most of them are just one timers but like there's only two filmmakers who make who have three movies in my top fifty so that's interesting to think about um what else where is the fucking wrist all good stuff I can't really complain rewatching True Grit I was like oh yeah I love that movie. So that's going in there. Um, Comet, love that movie. I cannot find 13. I'm gonna say I can't find 13. But yeah, Damn. in my top 20, my top five been set for like a couple of years now. So it ain't really been, that ain't really changed. Six to 10 was a little flexible, but it's basically the same. And then like 11 to 20 is like where the most movement has happened. But I think I like that 11. I like, I like 20 to 1. So, oh no, I put Anomaly Surprise. That's not good. I really can't find 13. Did I skip a 13 and go straight to 14? Where is the 14? Oh, I got the 14. Oh, I found it. Yes. Yes, we're moving here. All right, I'm almost done getting this thing in order. You understand that? Mm hmm. So yeah, I put, uh, I put Mama Lisa twice. So yeah, you suck. Little Women is now in the top twenty. Congrats, <laughs> congrats that was on purpose. Everything else moved up one. Very good. Um, uh, cool. All right, I'm at sixteen. Wait, I thought you said you had twenty. I do. I'm writing them down in order. 
Don't you guys computer open? Can't you just type it? I did this on hand. Oh, okay. Don't you let me do my thing, right? Lincoln. Where's 18? No, it's not Lincoln. So um, we'll just trade off. It'd be like 20, 20, 19. Oh, I found it. Oof. Mm-hmm. You hear what I said? What'd you say? So we'll just trade off your 2020, 19, 19, 18, 18, like that. Okay, one second. That works. I'm almost done. I'm all 18. Because my paper was so packed with words, I couldn't really tell what I marked. Because I have bad handwriting. But it only means I'm um, I'm creative. So, okay. <laughs> Why are you laughing at me? The way you said it. It only means I'm creative. <laughs> Have you, seen, hey, have, you, have you all seen Columbus? Columbus, Mississippi? I went there all the time. Hilarious. I mean the movie. <laughs> no. Uh, John Cho and Haley Lou Richardson. Check it out if you haven't. It's uh, in my top 50. It's actually number 23. I love it. And, uh, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's all right. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. All right, I'm ready. Got my top 20. All right, you want to go first? I don't feel confident. Um, yes. My number 20 is Little Women. I'm, with, I'm right there with you. Number 20, Little Women. I yeah, know. Sad. Uh, yeah, I love, I love that movie. Love it as well. I almost didn't want to love it. <laughs> it's, a, you know, like I, say, I always say it's comfort food. Like, I just put it on when I'm trying to sleep or when I'm, like, doing some, like, tab it on in the background, you know? It's just such a nice movie. Yeah, I watched it the second time in the theater. Yeah. It's one of the few movies that almost got me emotional. And I was like, ugh. Wow. Why I let this woman get me here? Like, Lady Bird is amazing. And it's, like, such an amazing achievement. But, like, Little Women is I think Little Women is better than Lady Bird. I do, too. I think Little Women is so special. And just and a lot of people don't feel that way. It's weird. Like, a lot of people, like, Lady... A lot of people I've seen be, like... Little Women is amazing, like Lady Bird, but it can't be Lady Bird because Lady Bird. Well, is kind of yeah, and, and people be like Lady Bird like change movies. I'm like what? It's not, I'm what not. It's not, I'm not even mad at it because it's like I get it. Lady Bird is amazing, but I'm like but Little Women. Like Little Women is like the way the way the way it like truly like orients the the original text to like specifically what she's trying to do. Like that book is not told the way she tells it, and how the and the way she tells it is specifically about how she wants what she wants to get across in terms of like memory and like childhood and nostalgia. Like she, the, the stuff she does in that movie is like extraordinary. Like it's, it's such a special movie. Yeah. I agree with you. Sad. What's your 19? My 19 is Honey Boy. Okay. Oh, that man hate me. No, it wasn't in my top 100, but it's a, it's I a, know, and, but it's, that it's a fantastic movie. Absolutely beautiful. Like, Charge is so misunderstood, man. Got these women, got these women trying to take him down. Got these liars. I thought he was talking about movies today. I thought he was talking about movies. That's why, that's why I say that. I was just like, okay. Liars trying to take him down. Yo, I'm not even. But I mean, anyway, I think it's it's beautiful. I love the music. I love the direction. I love the colors. It's it's like it's it's such an emotional journey, man. Cool. What's your nineteen? Uh, it's a French movie called Raw from 2017. Remember that? I know that nasty ass movie. One of the, I mean, well, I guess it's. I did that scene where that girl bite uh, her sister face. She don't bite her face. Remember, she accidentally cuts off her finger, and when she calls the police to be like, so they were attached, she accidentally tastes it and eats the finger before they, you know, before the police get there. Or the. Yeah, uh, that's the type of movie you like. Actually, that that would be my second favorite horror movie of the last. Uh, Ten years. Um, so I guess it's four in my top twenty, not just not three. Um, shit, I fucked up. Let me see something real quick. Mm, I do That's a nice round number. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I I love Raw. It's a coming of age story about a woman coming into her body, but but that's manifested as she also likes to eat people. So the more she becomes sexually awakened, the more her cannibalism kind of festers. And then she also has her sister, who is fully sexually open and everything, and like you know has lived in college and is like 
very different from who she was when they were growing up. But she's also very okay with like, yeah, I eat people. I don't give a fuck. Um, but it's a great movie. <laughs> it's beautiful. Has an amazing ending. The music is next level. The music is like terrifying and like it. The music feels like the color red. I don't know how they do it. But uh, yeah, she's only made one movie. That's her only movie. I don't know if she's making anything now. So the most pretentious thing you've ever said. It is, man. It feels like the color red. That's how I feel about Anti by Rihanna. It's like this feels like the color red. This album does. But yeah, Raw is a, is a is a masterpiece, so I'm cool with that. All right, what's your ninth? What's your eighteen? My eighteen is The Revenant. Okay. My the, the most beautiful movie of the decade, in my opinion. Um, I know it's quiet. I know it's long, but it's beautiful. Is it quiet? It's, uh, yeah, it's pretty quiet. Oh, uh, <laughs> you could. Yeah, you could. Yeah, it's kind of beautiful in it in a in a way. Uh, it's just like. But uh, yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, <laughs> kind of do right. Uh, but I loved everything about that movie. Oh my gosh! But yeah, uh, I think Leo is uh, phenomenal in it. I think it gets too much hate for how you know, for how uh, quiet it can be and how long it is. And people say nothing happens. I think a lot happens. It's just not said. People say nothing happens. <laughs> A lot happens. Yes. Yeah, so, so some people say like it just a Leo in the woods for three hours doing nothing. Nah, that's crazy. I've heard people say that, but um, I I love that movie. And every time it's on, I watch it. And that that lets me know a movie you got me. If I can just if I like, ooh, that's on. I don't care where it where it is. I'm picking it up, picking up right in it. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm done. Mm-hmm. So I got the Revenant at eighteen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it just it's just a gorgeous movie. Mm-hmm. Um, at eighteen, I have a mother, twenty seventeen. I thought about putting that on my list. I sh- probably should have. Yeah, I mean, it was on your list. It just wasn't the top twenty. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's my favorite Aronofsky movie. I love it to death. It's such a good movie. Bro. <laughs> it's such a good movie. It's so entertaining. It's so good. Man. It's it's funny. It's like scary. It's like smart, but it's also kind of dumb. It's just it's everything you need in a movie. Um. It was so good. Aronofsky got J Law off of it. Well, they were dating before. I, I, man, yeah, that's what they all. I, I really wish you had seen that movie in a the theater. It it's amazing at home, but in a theater. I don't know if I want. I feel like uh, I, I know some people have to walk out of that one. The only time I've ever seen people walk out of a movie was watching Mother. Um, the sound design is crazy, and that surround sound it's nuts. It's like overwhelming. Um, but yeah, it's Mother's wonderful. If you you know if you haven't seen it, you should. Everybody's performance is great. Best J Law performance in my opinion. But uh, yeah, love it. Good stuff. I did have um Silver Linings on this list. That's surprising. I and, thought about that, but I didn't care for that movie that much. So I love that movie, but it didn't make my hundred. That's weird. Okay. My number 17. 17 is Lincoln. Interesting. I still have I love I, I love the dialogue. Love the performance of Dane Davis Lincoln. I, I love movies like that. I, yeah, I just love movies where people talk, but it's like, like guys in suits talking, even if it's like the old suits back then and all that kind of stuff that they would do. I love movies about like, you know, uh, figuring out like geopolitical problems and things of that nature. Like, uh, yeah, I, just, I love it. Spielberg, Dang a Day. It's great. And it don't really get talked about a lot. Uh, I kind of came and went, but I think that is Masterclass by Dang a Day. Uh, yeah, I, I just... I remember watching it at the, at the Highlands and just being like, yeah, yeah, I I, I enjoy this probably more than most. So mm-hmm. yeah, that made my cut. And, and, I, and I think about some, I think about it often. And I think about some of the scenes and how he was talking and, and the inflection and everything. I, I love that movie. I love that movie. Great. Great. Um, my number 17, I wrote about it on Tap In. So, you know. Yes. Uh, it's a movie called Like Someone in Love from 2012 by... The great Abbas Kurastami. He made that movie Certified Copy, you know, that AnyWire talked about. Yes. So he made Certified Copy 2010, which most people consider like the best of the decade. You know? um, but I prefer Like Someone in Love that he made in 2012. It's a movie about a young girl who is a, a prostitute, high-class call girl, who, who doesn't want to work one night, 
but is is compelled to do so by her boss. And uh, on her way to the job, she I, I don't want to I, I can't even say all that stuff. But she gets her boss makes her go to the job because the dude is a friend of his, and she goes and spends the night with like this old professor guy. And then essentially the next morning, uh, the professor guy spends the day with her while hiding the fact that he is, you know, he paid her to be with him. And she goes to meet her fiance boyfriend, who's like this crazy abusive guy. And then he kind of like, and they just spend the day together. And that's the whole movie. And uh, it's like beautifully romantic. Uh, there's a part at the beginning where she listens to voicemails from her grandma um, on her way to the job. That is like, the first time I saw it, I was like crying. It was, it's one of the saddest things I've ever seen. <laughs> it, I mean, it truly is. Cause it's like, she, she desperately wants to see her grandma while she's on, she's visiting her. Um, yeah, she, de- she desperately wants to see her grandma while she's visiting her, but she can't. So she only listens to the voicemail. So she can get like a, a vibe for like, you know, being around her again. Yeah. You are? No, Jazz said she thought you start crying. <laughs> that was amazing. I'm gonna hang up. Yeah, that'd be nice. um, the day you start crying on this pod, we gotta talk. <laughs> but go ahead. Anyway, the whole the whole first half of the movie is just that night when she's going to the guy's house and they have these amazing conversations about art, and then like. I can't, it's hard to like intellectualize what makes this movie so special, but you have to really watch it because it's such a slow, quiet movie. And then it's like, you know, I can't even explore it. I can't explain it. And then, and then the ending though, the ending is so unsatisfying where I was watching it for the first time and the movie ended and I was like, what? We don't even know what happens. It ends when something really big happens and it just cuts out. And I'm just like, it, it doesn't resolve nothing. It's, it's. I mean, that's why I wrote about it. So I was like, this is like, you know, one of the great movies of all time. And, you know, it's beautiful. It takes place in Japan, modern day Japan. And, you know, it's foreign language. So, but it's, it's perfect. The perfect movie. I have the criterion. I love it so much. Like someone in love. Watch it. <laughs> and it what's your six? That's yeah, probably well after you done, done this diatribe. It's, <laughs> if y'all watch it, you may be like, because think, like, you know, I know how you feel about Portrait of a Lady, right? You still like it, even though you think it's slow. Yes. It's kind of like as slow as Portrait of a Lady, but it's less concrete about what it's about. Like, Portrait of a Lady is about the romance and about the world they create. Like, like someone in love, you watch it, and you're like, I don't know what this is about. Like, it ends before it really ends, and it kind of starts in the middle. And it's like, they're talking about art, and it's about, like, her... She's like this scared girl, and then she's now this like confident woman when she's at work. And then it's about her boyfriend being abusive, but not really. And then there's this weird neighbor that shows up and talks about how she never had a life because she always had to take care of her, her sick mom. It's very strange, but it's very beautiful. Anyway. Okay. What's your what's your um, I feel like I need to make a change right here. I feel like I did something wrong. You know what? Yeah, I did. So I'm going to tell you, I originally had uh blinds knives out here, right? I thought you about to say the blind, uh, blind spot. Really? I had knives out here, but then I was gonna switch it with a higher entry of blind spotting. But then I was like, blind spotting don't need to be here. I like that movie a lot, but it shouldn't. And I know the movie that does need to be here. And uh it needs to be higher. So I'm going back to my first original, it's knives out at this spot and I'm taking blind spotting out of my top. It doesn't mean it's not one of my favorites, but I got a movie that I disrespect it by not putting it in here. Oh, uh, so blind. So knives out. It's just the most fun movie I think on my list. I just enjoyed it the most. It's uh, I think about it often. We watched it not too long ago. It holds up. It's actually better. <laughs> I feel like it gets better every time you watch it. Uh, I felt more emotion the second time watching it. It's it's a wonderfully fun script and it's very smart and knows what it's trying to do. It got all the beats. It got a great cast. It's it's everything I like in a movie. Big cast, uh, fun writing, great writer, uh, you know, very fun direction, twists and turns, but, you know, everything makes sense, and it still has emotion in it. It it just, it does everything. I ain't got much to say because, you know, I just enjoy it so much. So it just, yeah, I think think that this is the right spot for it, too. Cool. Cool. Yeah. 
I hate the noise. I echo. It's so weird. Um, okay. Well, my 16, I also wrote about on Tap In, but I don't think the article is very good. But uh, I wrote, um, my 16 is Madeline's Madeline. Oh, my gosh. No, 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 no. Yep. <laughs> if you've seen the movie, you know what that means. But I don't. It's on, it's on Amazon Prime. Now you got to watch. It's like an hour and a half. It's real short. It's such a great movie. It's such a great movie about 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 childhood. It's such a great movie about like being a black kid amongst white people. It's so good about. It's such an amazing movie about performance and what performance can do and how performance is a means of expressing one's own mental like handicaps. Like this is about. I mean, Madeline, the main character, played by Helen Howard, in an amazing performance, is a girl who has like some sort of mental illness. Like she has weird anger management problems and weird ways, weird, weird ticks when associating to other people, like weird boundary issues. Like there's a really uncomfortable scene where she flirts with um like a 40 year old man. He's like, what the fuck is going on? Uh, and she's so good at it. Cause it's really uh, kind of disturbing. Um, but you know, the whole movie, I mean, like the thing about performances, this girl has this really bad mental handicaps and she's like angry and like sad and manic. But when she gets to perform, when she gets to play as a cat or be a turtle or or work in this play, this workshop thing she's doing, it kind of becomes her best self and expresses everything so clearly. And it's about like, you know, the work she does is a conduit for her to be able to like express herself in a way that she couldn't otherwise. You know, her mother is weirdly protective, almost judgmental, but like, you know, all she internalizes all this stuff until she gets to perform. And then it comes out in like such a big way, and everybody's like, "She's a great actor." And they're like, "What? Where does this come from?" And it's like, because she just can't express it other in other ways without being like offensive or dangerous or, uh, you know, a threat to herself or others. I mean, there's there's one scene I won't give nothing away. I mean, like the whole movie is amazing, and it's stolen this weird elliptical, elli- uh, not elliptical, elliptical style that is almost like you're purely in the perspective of Mal- Madeline's mind, so it, nothing really like connects or is like linear. But it's very specific. But you always know where you are. It's kind of like how Hel- how Helena, how Madeline sees the world. Like just moments happen, moments of big big emotion, and then it pulls back, and you go to something completely different. Um, but there's an amazing moment where she invites some boys to like her basement, and they all watch porn down there. And her mom finds her, and it's one of the most uncomfortable things I've ever seen because the mom freaks out. She thinks her child is like about to have an orgy with these boys, and yet it, it's very strange. And, like, you know, Madeline freaks out. She's like, Mom, you're fucking crazy. And then her mom freaks out. She's like, Madeline, you're sick. You have, like, an illness. You shouldn't be alone with boys. It's it's great. But, you know. Anyway, Madeline's Madeline. It's a wonderful movie. Especially if you're... Especially if you can relate to being, like, a black person amongst a lot of white people who kind of who kind of mean well but are in some ways taking advantage. It's, it's really interesting. But, uh... It's only an hour and a half. It's on Amazon Prime. You know, everybody watch it. Yeah. Knew what, you'd go what, there. What's your uh, 15, Nate? My 15 is If Bill Street Could Talk. Great. It's the beautiful movie. And it's wonderful. It's the, uh, uh, what do you say? That Bertel scored, though. Huh? That Bertel scored, though. Yeah, right. Uh, great performances. Uh, a realistic. I don't know. I don't know. What I want to say about it. I just think it. Uh, it shows love in a way that I don't think anybody has done as. Uh, not anybody, obviously, but I don't think it's been done as realistically. Uh, I, I just, I just appreciate it, uh, how it showed it, and I appreciated everything that uh that, that everybody's doing, especially like Brian Tyree Henry, giving his all for those few minutes he was in it and. Uh, everything like that, and the music and the, and the shots and the close-ups, it's just a really wonderful. Movie. And uh, I, I, my movies are based on the experience I have with them, mm-hmm. and just going to see it in Memphis with you know, uh, on that cold day, I think it was snowing. It just you know everything around it just kind of brings the the whole experience up for me, and 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 also the, and and the movie helps with that as well. It, you know, it just, it just did everything right, and I uh, I think it's better than uh, than Moonlight myself. I, I, uh, you said what? I agree. Yeah. So, uh, and I think Moonlight is great, but I think Bill Street, man, it's, it's a damn near perfect. That's a, almost a flawless movie, man. So, 
Oh, uh, yeah, I got that here. Great. And it's probably Great. and it's probably a little low. I'll be honest. Feels fine. Yeah, I don't know. But go ahead with yours. Uh, my number fifteen is a most violent year. And you know it. Of course. Uh, yeah. 2014, J.C. Shandor. Honestly, Shandor should have had a few more on my hundred. I'm not going to cap. Much like Kelly Reichardt, I think they need uh, more representation, and they probably will if I revise this. But the most violent year, perfect movie, perfect crime movie, amazing dual performances, lead performances from uh, Jessica Chastain and Oscar Isaac, probably my favorites from both of them, period. And then also a great David O'Yellowo performance. Also, it's beautiful looking, you know. Yeah, say you know it's it, I mean that's a movie that's less about like what it's saying about world and who we are as people and more about like this is just like a perfect a perfect specific story told better than anything I've ever seen most of anything I've ever seen um I said, man I can't believe I ain't got more Jeff Chris Abbott on here like I should James White should be on this list somewhere anyway uh James White such a good movie check out James White 2015 great movie um. But a most violent year, perfect, wonderful, great ending. They're supposed to be working on a sequel soon, and I hope they call it um, like a, a path least, a path most good, or something like that. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, I love it. It's just, I just think it's, I think Bradford Young's photography, cinematographer Bradford Young, I, I think he, the way he shoots movies is unlike anything I've ever seen. You know, I'm not, a, I'm not a big Arrival fan, but he shot Arrival, and the way that movie looks, I think is just extraordinary and I think he carries that over to the most violent year. He carries it over into solo, into Selma, everything he does. Um so what was the point? Um uh, yeah, I just love the most violent year. Of course you do. What's your uh what's your fourteen? My fourteen is Inception. Cool. I think it's Nolan's best movie that I've seen. Better than Dark Knight, um, is it? Oh it not better than Dark Knight, you're right. I said Dunk. Yeah. I know Dark Knight, um, but yeah, I think I, I think what he does with the whole premise—it's it's obviously it's Nolan to a T, but it does the most with what he's good at. I think he capitalizes. I think he, you know, he expands the most on what he's good at. He kind of minimizes what he's not as good at, but I'll also give him some stuff that uh, people say he don't give as much. You know, the the, the emotional aspects and beats. Uh, I love Cobb the character and, and Leo. I love I love the whole cast like everybody it just it was it's another great cast movie and that's always a plus for me it has scenes I remember to this day and think about like the scene when uh Cillian Murphy is talking to his father and all of the dreams are starting to come up and as he start he realizes uh, that his father didn't want him to you know do whatever it was or whatever you know and then and the whole crying scene and all that I think that stuff is great uh, yeah yeah I I think it's 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 Close to his best movie. It, it's his best movie that isn't a you know comic book movie that I've seen. I ain't seen Interstellar. I ain't seen Dunkirk. Uh, I can only go on what I've seen. Have you uh, seen my best? My mentor? No. Yeah. Mm, cool. I almost bought the following on the Criterion Collection. That's a good. That's a good movie. That movie's okay. Uh, so yeah, I ain't seen enough of his stuff, obviously, but I do think Inception is great, and I think everybody, most people, would agree with that. So. Uh, yeah, yeah. I thought I think that's a good spot. Probably a little too high, but it's fine. Nah, I man. You like what you like. That's why I said I, I, I would know. So that's why I think it's too high. Okay, then. Um, why don't you shut your mouth? Uh, my number fourteen is her. Twenty thirteen. Love it. Love this since I saw it. Beautiful, beautiful movie. Um, what really unlocked this movie for me? I remember it was twenty fourteen. Yeah, so it was freshman year of college. And I was walking to Giles or somewhere, and I was listening to a podcast. And it was a trans woman talking about why she loved her so much. And it was, and she was speaking about why she felt that movie was about a different and new way to love. You know, loving a, an OS uh, and it not being a, like a, a typical relationship, and feeling represented in the way that they kind of portrayed like the unorthodox and uncomfortable nature of that relationship. That's like a point that I never even thought about. And I just thought the way she explained it back then was like beautiful. And then, you know, other than that, I love all the other stuff. I love the, love the sci-fi-ness of it. I love the romantic, I love how romantic it is. I love the colors. I love how it's made. I love Joaquin Phoenix's performance. Um, 
it's not my favorite Walking Phoenix performance in the last ten years. That might be that might be the Master or uh, the Immigrant with uh, from James Gray. Either one of those two, but I think her is maybe his best movie overall that he's in. Um, Olivia Wilde is in it for a scene, and she's fucking amazing in it. You know, Amy Adams is dope. Uh, Carl Johansson gives an amazing performance. I just, I just love everything about that movie. It's very sweet. Also, it does, a, it, it does a thing with sci-fi that I love that not enough sci-fi I don't think does, where it's, it's about this romance thing, but it's also very much about the way we live in like a technologically advanced world where like, you know, Theodore, I think that's uh, Joaquin's character's name, is a guy who professionally writes love letters to people, you know, that even something like intimacy is outsourced to like a whole company. And just like the little, the little touches in which it talks about society and like the, how we disconnect from humanity, even though we're kind of like, it's a story about like loving this person, but it's like, you know, S Samantha is not a person. She is... She she is a series of ones and zeros that is that mimics humanity, but you know what does that mean and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, that's it. I, I do enjoy the movie as well. I think it's beautiful. Yeah, love it. Um, what's your thirteen? My next one is Creed. Great. Um, you know what can you say? It's Ryan Coogler, Michael B. <laughs> but uh, it's Ryan Coogler, Michael B. And um, was it Coogler's second feature? And you know, he, he won't, can you send me you this know, list uh, when we're done with this? Yeah. Okay. Talk about the top twenty or all of them? Both. Gotcha. Uh, but yeah, it's Creed. It's um. It's probably my favorite boxing movie, but I haven't seen ones like Southpaw. I haven't seen um, Raging Bull, all of those. But, you know, it's Michael B. and, like, his most movie star miss uh, a great, subdued, uh, Sly Stallone part. So I think he's it's really underrated, actually, how good he was in that movie. Uh, it's Ryan Coogler hitting on all beats. It, it's really great. And... Uh, I really would have loved to see Kugler's Creed too, because I think that would have uh it might have been remembered a little better, right? Even though that movie's really good as well. But uh Creed too, man, it was like a snapshot of a moment. Like it got me in the gym. It like it made real impact on my life at the time. And I remember watching it like I genuinely loved the movie, like having chills and everything. Uh, yeah, man. And that's another movie like you just catch it whenever it's on. I watch some of it, a little bit, all the rest of it, whatever. The final shot is amazing, beautiful, a tribute to the past. Um, he took that movie, took that series and that franchise, made it his own. And uh, and that's hard to do, to bring a vision to a franchise that's already, you know, got so much lore and add a piece to it. And, and everybody's like, yeah, I, I like that that's part of it now. Instead of being like, no, it sucks. Um, so he did something very special there. And I hope we get more movies like that from him. I don't think so. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, Creed is here. And I think it's well deserved it's a phenomenal movie and a very fun uh, movie as well cool um yeah love oh movie. i know what i did wrong okay good all right yeah it I wasn't long spotting you or something else oh okay um i love creed man it's such a great movie um okay so my 13 is a uh, carol 2015 hmm hmm that Carter Burwell score, man, so good. That movie is uh, beautiful. Beautifully made. Yeah, beautiful. Beautifully told. You know, amazing performances from, you know, everybody, really, in that movie. Kyle Chandler, Sarah Paulson, you know what I'm saying? Rooney Mara, Rooney Mara, uh, Kate Blanchett. They're all fantastic. Um, what I really love about that movie is I just think it's – I think I think the story itself is like amazing, right? But it's a simple story and it tells you know it's about simple things and I'm like okay cool I, I understand it. Um, and I think there's a lot of depth in it, but I don't think it's like trying to do too much. It's very focused uh, in its ambition. But I think the way it's told is just absolutely next level. Like Todd Haynes is one of my favorite filmmakers probably ever, and I think there's there's not a wrong move. There's another movie on this list that I think is 
that I would consider a perfect movie where it's like, I don't know if you can make any of this better. And I feel the same way about Carol, which I'm like, from the colors to costuming, everything. And it's, you know, beautiful story about two women who fall in love in the 1950s and, you know, have to deal with the prejudice of that. But it's beyond that. It's just this a gorgeous movie about, like, you know, love and isolation and feeling alone, like, especially during a time when you couldn't be open about who you were. So the moment where they kiss for the first time is, like, this amazing moment because they finally admit to each other that they really do love each other. Um, it's just it's perfect, man. Uh, again, I listen to the, the score for Carol, the Carter Burwell score. I listen to it just all the time. Like, I'm just, whenever I'm doing something, it's it's perfect. It's, like, so romantic, so beautiful. Um and so, like, classical, but also very modern. It's wonderful. I love it so much. Uh, and the final shots, not the final shots, but the final final beats of that movie are perfect. Also, uh, if you and if you do like Carol, my second favorite Tom Haynes movie is a movie called Far From Heaven from 2014, 2004. And it also set in the 1950s, but it's about a woman who falls in love. Who is about a, It's about, like, a suburban housewife whose husband comes out as gay. And so she's kind of left alone because he leaves her. Um, and then she falls in love with her gardener, who's a black man. And then that also adds a bit of complication because, like, you know, 50 suburbia, like middle America. And and that movie is, is very similar to Carol in a lot of ways in, like, the way it's presented, uh, the, the colors and all this stuff. Like, Carol is more muted and, like, uh, Far From Heaven is more, like, pastoral. Like, pastoral, what I'm trying to say. It's, it's a lot more brighter in its presentation. It's a lot more like Douglas Sirk. They both are, but that one definitely more so. And especially the ending of Far From Heaven. Is <laughs> ending of Far From Heaven is kind of bittersweet in that it's a story about like two people who want to be together, but because of the time they can't. And Carol's ending is like, yeah, the time won't let us be together, but fuck them. We're going to be together anyway. I love Carol. Okay, I see what you're doing. What, what's your number 12? My next one is The Lighthouse. You talk about atmosphere. You talk about setting, you talk about uh, suspense, you talk about building a world uh, where f- that it feels authentic, and you talk about great acting, uh, a very accurate, intricate uh, script. You talk about every facet of a movie being commanded by a director. Then you have it in The Lighthouse with Robert Eggers and uh, Robert Pattinson and Willem Dafoe. Willem Dafoe's uh, performance will stand the test of time, I believe. One of the best ones we've seen in a long time. Robin Pattinson, just another performance to show that he is, he's just amazing. And uh, <laughs> the whole Twilight thing is gone. It's been gone, but that just shows you to a T, it's not there no more. That that guy is uh, way more than that. And, you know, if it took that long to realize it, then hey. But that's that's one of the more... That's one of the more overall pleasing movies to me in every facet that I've seen in a long time of my life. Like everything, like the editing, the direction, the cinematography, like the lack of a score, you know, everything, all of the beats, all of the acting. It's it's just it's like an A to A plus in all of it. And uh, I enjoy that movie so much. And I thought it would be a tough hang. It's not. It's fun to me. Like <laughs> a black and white movie like that is fun. And mm-hmm. I I wouldn't have gone into it thinking that at first, but I think about that movie so much. I think about the performances, I think about the dialogue. When I'm writing, I'm like, you be as accurate in every facet of your movie as Robert Eggers was and make it and care about it that much to where you care about even the smallest things like he did. And it's 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 such a movie, man. It's it's such a uh, fully recognized, fully formed movie. And I love it so much. Cool. <clears throat> Uh, I've been thinking about the movie a lot lately too. I kind of want to rewatch it. I think you need to. But, uh, uh, my number twelve is a uh, Moonrise Kingdom, twenty twelve. Wes Anderson. Uh, my favorite Wes Anderson flick. Um, just wonderful, man. Just, you know, don't get no better than that. Much like the previous two movies on my list, just a really romantic movie about you know childhood innocence and stuff. Most people will say like Grand Budapest Hotel is the one. And that one has like a bit more melancholy in it and a bit more like kind of not nostalgia, but like a hindsight and looking back on, you know, certain times and ideas. And I think that movie is an epic in a way that Moonrise Kingdom is on a, on a smaller on a smaller scale. But I just think Moonrise is perfect. 
I mean, there's just mo- there's moments in Moonrise that I that I can see in my mind specifically, and it's just like unlike any other Wes Anderson movie, which I love most of his movies. That one in particular, I just think it nails his aesthetic, and is also very focused on like gr- a grounded relationship of like people. He's just wonderful. I should have had Cloud Atlas on this list. I don't know what I'm doing. Not not in the top twenty, but in the top hundred at least. Should have had some Wachowski representation. I'm to... No, he didn't need it. Uh, whatever. Uh, what's your eleven? My eleven is Uncut Gems. What's more to be said? Man? What is more to be said? It's the movie that got me fully invested in the Safety Brothers moving forward. No matter what they do, even uh, I don't necessarily want it to be TV, but I'm into anything that they are helming. That movie is. It never stops. It's anxious. You hey, feel every emotion. Hey, Nate, uh, I, I don't know if you've heard, heard this about some TV, but uh, some of them are eight-hour movies. Yeah, I, I'm sure. But I, I like a two-hour movie. But um, it doesn't stop. It's anxious. Your heart is like your heart is beating as fast as the characters. And right up to the very end, you never stop, you, ne- you never breathe into the end because you can't. Uh, everybody's talking at the same time, which I've seen, like, you know, it's, uh, people are like, I didn't like that movie, but I couldn't hear what nobody saying. Like, obviously, that's the point. But, uh, <laughs> you got some mm-hmm. idiots on there. But, uh, great acting from people like Kevin Garnett. Idiots. No, I make sure you an idiot. Great acting from people like Kevin Garnett, who you just, uh, his first role, he comes in and uh, it's almost as if you've been acting for a long time, right? He's he's so poised. Uh, Adam Sandler obviously can give you this anytime he gets a role like this and, and he wants to do it. He can do it with the best of them. Julia Fox, breakout star. The Safety Brothers, breakout stars. Like, the the, cinematog- the cinematography by Darius Kanji, who's working PTA, obviously you know what that's going to be. <clears throat> uh, a fully fleshed out new idea showing that movies can still have great ideas and it don't have to be anything you've seen or heard before. Um, it can come from somebody's mind to the screen and it can still be fun and well-made, crafted, and everybody can enjoy it and still be artistically uh, fulfilling. That, that's that movie. Uh, I don't know how I didn't get in my top 10 if this is 11, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it should be. It's one of my favorite movies ever. Uh, I have movies over it, but it, it, it's just the luck of the draw. This very well could have been in my top five. No cap. Cool. Um, my number 11 is The Wolf of Wall Street. You're probably going to have it later on, so I'm just not going to we'll wait on that. I, yeah, I do have it later on. Okay. What's your 10? My 10 is Django Unchained. Great. It's a movie that I can pick up. Like I, I keep saying this, that those are the movies I enjoy. I, if I can, if I see it and pass it, it, I might like it, but I might not have a, I might not be in the mood. If I'm not in the mood to watch something, I still turn it on if it's on. That's how you know Django is. It's it's one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, I still think about Will's idiotic decision to not be in it, but <laughs> whatever. Uh, <laughs> it's it's wonderful. It's. Will, Will, Will probably read the script. He was like, I say like five lines in the whole movie. And you let the little the little Dennis guy talk more than me. <laughs> the little Dennis guy. Like he, you know, he ain't seen Inglorious Bastard. He's like, I don't know who that is. Like, Christoph, what? <laughs> no. Christoph who? He said he's the I was on the board at Sundance. <laughs> no, at Cannes. Yeah, Cannes, yeah. That's nah, that's he, the I'm sure, I'm sure he knows who Christoph Waltz is. Um, no, he doesn't. But uh but I mean, Great sure performance. He's, he's probably a Tarantino fan like everybody else is. It's 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 a revenge story through and through. You know, slave gets the he gets them all back. It's like Birth of a Nation, but you know, uh, in QT's flair and style. Uh, yeah, it's one of my favorite movies ever. Uh, it's one of my top three uh, QT movies. Uh, I don't think it's appreciated enough, actually, from QT lovers. And I have an idea of why, but I ain't gonna even get to that here. But uh, I mean, what can you say about Django Unchained that hasn't already been <clears throat> been said? So it's great. Where is my sister? Um, cool. All nah, right, uh, this guy. Uh-huh. Uh, my number ten is Before Midnight. You know, Richard Linklater, twenty thirteen, banger, banger, banger. Uh, those movies are <laughs> those are some of the most well written movies ever. Some of those well acted movies ever. I didn't have first reformed on this top 100. It did just didn't make the cut. But you know, I love Ethan Hawke to death. I love first reformed also. But but before midnight, man, I love Jesse and Celine. I love them in Before Sunrise, Before Sunset. I love them before midnight and before midnight. You know, 
Every time I watch it, I'm like, this is so much better than I remember. And it happens every single time. And I look, every time I watch it, I'm like, this is one of my favorite movies. And I watch it again. I'm like, how is it better than I remember? Um, it's, it's wonderful. I don't know how Rutland Clater does it. it. It's, if you watch the movie, he's just watching, he's just walking, not watching. He's following, so them, watch them. he's following them while they talk. But he, but he cuts back and forth between the front and the back of them. So then I'm like, this dude had to have done like multiple takes of this because like, and these are long conversations that are like feel very natural, and you know that can't be easy to do, especially. And he keeps the continuity too. It's crazy how good it is. It's like it's so small, but you'd be like, what well, is you know this probably didn't take. It's probably not that hard to do or to pull off. And then it's it's like no, that's extremely difficult to pull off to make it look effortless the way he does. And then the final scene where it all takes place in the hotel room and they just have an argument. It's amazing. It's amazing. What movie is this again? Before Midnight, the final in that yeah, 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 yeah. Gotcha. Gotta watch. I would say watch all of them, but they all work on their own. They all have their own merits, you know. And this one also has its own merits. It's very, uh, very uncomfortable in a lot of places, but also very fun in a lot of places. That makes sense. It's great. Love, love Greece. Right. Love Greece. What's your uh, What's your nine? Now, this is where I had the problem. I had Blind Spotting, then I had Fruitvale. Okay, uh, point of reference. I had the right movie. It wasn't Blind Spotting, but the nine was right next to it, which I got confused. And I didn't put the movie it was, which then I found and was like, oh, that needs to be there. So if I had a 21 through 25, Fruitvale would be in there with movies like Us, and Bad Times at the El Royale, Mid-90s, and Loose. But it's not here. And it ain't Blind Spotting either. My number nine is Focus. Oh, great movie. It should have yes. been on my top 100. Yeah, I don't know how it wasn't. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, man, this this movie <laughs> it means so much. To me, bro. I was like, because it showed Will Smith still has it. He still has it. Uh, you know, great early Margot after Wolf. Oh, but before, uh, before you keep going, I will say, still my favorite Margot thing she's done outside of Wolf of Wall Street. Still my favorite Mar. She has done nothing as good as this. Now I love her as Harley Quinn, but I'm like y'all. Y'all talking about Harley Quinn? Have y'all seen Focus though? That's my question. You talking about I turned you? Have you seen Focus? Have you seen Focus? To be fair, I have not seen I turned. But I ain't either. I ain't seen Bombshell either. I know what I. I, I don't think. I don't. Yeah, I'm, I don't think it's gonna be hidden like uh, Focus is though. Man. This movie, man. I don't know. I don't know who directed it. I don't know who wrote it. I need to look up those things at some point. But man, it like. It feels like an old, it feels like an older movie, an older Will Smith movie, but also a new age movie at the same time. It has two sides. Both are equally great to me. I, as I keep watching it, the second half might be better than the first half. Uh, it does so many things with like love and, uh, you know, it, it's a it's an old school crime movie or a heist movie, if you will. Will Smith is like back in the, like he back in action on this one, man. He got a young Margot Robbie to work with. They, and they have such great chemistry, and they bounce off each other so well. I love some of the shots. I love the soundtrack. I listen to the soundtrack sometimes. Uh, I love the I love the performances. I love uh, I, I, I love this movie, man. I I genuinely love this movie. It's not talked about enough. It's one of Will Smith's best. It's I think it's Will Smith's best movie in my opinion, and I stand by that. It's wonderful. And they, and, uh, I hear you. Men in Black exists. Okay. Men in Black ain't better than folks. Men, Black, Men in Black is better than most movies. Men in Black is not better than most movies. It's a great movie, but it ain't better than most movies. Name a movie, now, name a movie more perfect than Men in Black. You can't. Uh, all the movies on this list. Okay. See this guy. All the movies I didn't name. Like, I got movies I left off my list and still got, and they still better than Men But anyway, focus, focus, focus. One of my favorite movies of all time. Great. Right in that 2015 period where people was like, oh, wait, Will Smith got up. Like, and the only one I hear talking about the movie is Bill Simmons. And I agree with his words. Focus is amazing. So It is. I totally agree. Um, all right. My number nine is a very conventional movie that, like, if you watch it, the first time you watch it, like I did, I was like, that's really sweet. I teared up when I watched it. And then I, and then I went about my day. And then I watch it again, and I watch it again, and I watch it again, and then I watch it, and then I showed it to Mama, and she watched it again and again, and then and then she watched it one day, and I walked in, and I sat in and watched it with her and Carmen, and I was like, this is not, this is perfect, I love it. It's a movie called Loving from 2016. It's on Netflix now. 
run, don't walk, okay? It's a beautiful, true story about Mildred and Richard Loving, the, uh, a couple who helped uh, break the, the anti messaging I hate, I hate this word. Messagenation? Anyway, miscegenation. Miscegenation. Anyway, the, there was laws about interracial marriage that it was it was a you can you couldn't do it in certain states in this country. And because of them and their love for each other, Mildred was black, Richard was white, and they fought the they fought the good fight. You know what I'm saying? They, they hey, Ruth like, Nega in this. Ruth Nega gives probably that's why you like it. Ruth Nega probably gives my favorite female performance of the decade in this movie. No cap. Uh, I think I think her and Joe Ledgerton are amazing in it. I think Ruth Nega in particular, I would say Joe Ledgerton is pretty amazing too, probably top 10. I would say Ruth Nega's performance, I'm like, I don't know if there's a better performance in an American film in the past 10 years. Um, it's so wonderful. It starts with them together, they get married. There, there's moments in this movie because it's so it's so like classic Hollywood about like you know this it's not even about like them fighting the power to get their love out there because they're very understated people they're both like the very modest people from the south and they're just like I just want to do my work and raise my kids in a nice home and I don't want to be bothered and so like that that kind of that kind of attitude continues over the whole movie like there's moments when like the press comes in and Time Magazine comes and like you know you're you know what you're well, you know you're fighting the laws in the state like what you're doing is going to change people's lives everywhere across this country and they're and they're just kind of like yeah we you know it's okay we just kind of want to live our lives where we want to live them and it's and it's nothing's big about it there's no big like speech there's no big moment of like um like them standing up to the cops or nothing it's just every moment they're just kind of like well we love each other so why wouldn't we want to try to do this. And it is wonderful. There's there's moments in it that make me cry. There's two moments in particular. There's a moment when they sneak back into the state where it's illegal for them to be married, so that she can have her have a baby with her family because her family is in this state. Um, and then the police somehow find out, and they come to arrest them the next day. And it's and the police come to the house. They say, uh, I think uh, Richard goes out. And he's like, my Mildred's not here. And he says, Look, if you don't bring Mildred out here, I'm going to arrest everybody. And Mildred, she walks out. Put, puts on her jacket and she walks out and just gets in the police car. It is so heartbreaking because it's just a moment of her being like, I know, like I, I did this because I want to be with my family when I have my child. And yet uh, I know that this is what I have to do. And like, it's just this moments of quiet strength. She has. Like it's, it's little things throughout the entire movie. Like there's a moment, there's moments when like, you know, the press comes and asks them all questions and you can see Joel Edgerton as, as Richard. He's so uncomfortable with the cameras and the, and like people asking him questions. He's like a really reserved guy. And then she, you just see her. She'll grab his hand, look him in the eye, and she'll give him a, give him a smile. And she'll look at the people in the camera. She's like, well, we're just doing And then she'll talk for them. And it's, it's, it's little moments like that throughout the entire movie. Uh, at the very end of the movie, um, uh, so they so they take the, they take the case to the Supreme Court and uh, so you don't even see it you don't you don't see them talk to the judge or nothing um, that's how that's how understated the movie is it doesn't care about any of that it's just about them um, and uh, the the lawyer comes to them and he says to Mildred and, and Richard he's like we're gonna take it to the Supreme Court uh, we're gonna put your case on there and they're gonna say whether or not it's legal or legal to do this um, and then Richard basically says we're not going because I don't want to stand in a courtroom and tell people why my why I can't even do it. He tells people he's like uh, I, <laughs> he says I don't want to explain to people why I love my wife and why that matters. And then he walks out. And then uh, Mildred's like you know he's he's very uncomfortable with these types of things. And then the lawyer goes and talks to him, and it's, it makes me cry every single time. He says he asked to uh, he asked uh, Joel Edgerton. He's like uh, Mr. Loving, what do you do? What do you want me to say to the Supreme Court, the biggest judge in the nation, or whatever? And he just says just tell him I love my wife. It's the way he delivers it. He says, just tell him I love my wife, and that's all that matters. And then, you know, they go, and then they do that, and then they learn about it, and, there's, and then, you know. Hey, we got other movies. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I'm almost done. <laughs> <laughs> I love this movie so much. And nobody talks about it. It's just so wonderful. Uh, and then the very end, um, you know, they do a little postcard where they're like, Mildred and Richard lived until this, this, and that, and then they died on this day, this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, I uh, – Richard Loving died in the 70s or 80s, I believe, and Mildred didn't die until like 2007. And um, they talked. She did. She gave. She gave one final interview before she died, uh, and they asked her like, "What do you think about you know the case and stuff?" She's like, "I miss Richard dearly. He, he like he took care of me. 
I wish he was still here. And it's and then that's what it was like. It's not like I love him and I can't live without him. It's just like this little. T- she's like, yeah, I mean, he he took care of us, and every day I wake up, I just wish he was here, and he's not. And it's that's the kind of emotion that underpins the whole movie, where it's like they don't show big emotion, they don't like they don't do big gestures. They're just kind of like simple people who like had to come up against this like huge behemoth of like the American government because simply because they just wanted to be together. And it's it's on Netflix now. It's perfect. It's wonderful. You may watch it the first time and be like, I don't get it. And like, this is like fine. This is like a good, based on a true story. And I'm like, you don't get it. You got to watch it like five times. Cause every time it comes on, I'm like, I'm going to watch loving. It, it should be on TV. And I'm like, Hey, y'all want to watch loving? Let's, let's do it. Um, anyway, sorry. What's your uh, number eight? Nate? My number eight is Mad Max Fury Road. Great movie. It's just an achievement. It's, it took all them years. I think he thought about it, what, back in, like, the 90s or something like that. And it, it took, you know, over a decade. He finally he started making it, what, uh, like, 2012. And it took three years to get it all done, like, uh, thousands of storyboards. Just a, uh, it's all, it's mostly practical, a little CGI here and there. But it's all mostly practical, uh, mostly real actors and real stuntmen and drivers. It's just, uh, we won't see it again. Uh, and then it still has a story, it still has heart, it still has a meaning, and it's saying something. Furiosa by Charlie Theron is wonderful. She, she's she's akin to those female leads like uh, Ripley and people like that. You know, women that uh, that do with their actions, and they ain't got to tell you, oh, I'm a woman like uh, uh, Margot yeah. Robbie, whacker. but uh, anyway. Like uh, you mean like Sarah uh, Connor and uh, Ellen Ripley and Charlie's Angel? Like, ooh, you know that you know that women are like, oh, that's no, 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 no. It, it it ain't like that. Like it's you know, she does her actions. She's trying to take care of these women. You know, it's all very understated. Then you got Tom Hardy, and he's great. And uh, and the ringer don't like his performance. They say he's kind of bad in it. I think he's pretty good, but they say his voice does this thing where he don't really know how to talk th- throughout of it. But whatever. I love the action sequences. I love like. Uh, oh what a day! Oh what a bloody! Oh what a lovely day! All that kind of stuff. It has quotables. Has great action. Has the quiet moments. Uh, and, and levity. It has like uh deaths that that mean a lot. Has a vicious death with the main bad guy. That's that was terrible. Um, uh, all culminating in this big scene at the end when the when the people who are uh, oppressed finally take over. It has great messages. It, it, it's a wonderful movie, and it will stand the test of time. That's a cinematic achievement that you can't get unless it's in a movie. You can't get that in a television show. You say, oh, Game of Thrones. Most of that is CGI. It ain't real. This was mostly real, mostly practical effects, 98% practical effects. You'll never get nothing like this again. It was fully realized in the mind of a great man named, what's his name? George. <laughs> yeah, George Miller. Uh, if, you know, he, if he could do it again, but the, that shows the power of cinema, and that's all I got to say about Mad Max Fury Road. Okay, my number eight is uh, Mistress America. Um, Noah Baumbach, co-written by Baumbach and uh, Greta Gerwig, starring Greta Gerwig and Lola Kurt. It's uh, I think it's the funniest movie of the last ten years. I think it's it's probably one of the most well-written comedies I've ever seen. Amazing screwball comedy. Probably ain't the last of those two. Huh? Sorry. Probably ain't the last of those two on your list, huh? I mean, this is the highest, so this is number eight. This is the highest of. This is the highest bomb on my list, yeah. I think th- I think this is his best film. I think it's you one of the best. That other joint I ain't gonna say yet. What Mary's story? No. Nah. Francis Hall? Yeah. I said it already. It's like a uh, thirty-nine or something. That's crazy. Where is it? Cause I got Mary's story at thirty. I got Mary's story at thirty-four, and Francis Ha at. Where's Francis Ha? Why do I have it? Oops. Yeah. So Marriage Story at 34, Francis High. Yeah, at least. Marriage Story 34, Francis High 38. Thought you would have Francis High in the top 20 at least. Marriage Story the top 50 movies in the last 10 years. That's pretty good. Um, I said Francis High. That's what I said, Francis High. I think I think being a top 100 movie in the last 10 years is pretty amazing. Um, but yeah. My favorite, my favorite Bombay movie, and my favorite uh, thing that um, they work together on is Mistress America from 2015. So funny, so well done, so smart, so like 
uh, so much of like a critique of like millennial culture and like New York culture and stuff. It's brilliant and it's really sweet, but also like kind of nasty and like the humor is the humor is kind of mean. It's it's great. Uh, check it out if you haven't. It's a wonderful comedy. I think it's the funniest movie of the last ten years. What's your number? What's your number seven? My number seven is the town. Cool. Look at my top window. I, you said it wasn't. It was. I absolutely love this movie. Um, right at 2010, before the changes, you know, before streaming took off, this was one of those movies that now I feel like wouldn't be a movie. I feel like it'd be like a six-part series on Amazon Prime or something. Mm-hmm. And that sad, and that saddens me because this needs to be a movie, right? Mm-hmm. I love, I love, uh, love Ben Affleck. I love what he's trying to do here. This is a, uh, this is a very interesting point in his career before Argo, before all of it, and it's just this small Boston movie he makes uh, with Jeremy Renner. He directs. I was listening to the Ryan Rossillo pod from a couple months back. He got this uh, producer on there who's produced movies like Sicario, The Town, John Wick, and he was talking about how the uh, studio, um, no, how Ben Affleck wanted a director, and they called a few people, but everybody couldn't do it. So the studio asked him to do it, and he said, he reluctantly said, yeah. The producer was uh, Ben, not Ben, uh, the producer was Basil Iwanek. He produced John Wick, Sicario, The Town, amongst other stuff. Hmm. He was just talking about how they was in Boston, and it was such a fun set. It was so uh, lighthearted, and how uh, I remember a funny story that the studio was like, uh, one of the guys you're trying to get on is one of the drivers or whatever. He has a felon, and we can't do that because we're a publicly traded company. And then he was like, oh, no, 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 it's fine. Like, And then they were like, we can't. And so they got rid of him, and he got somebody else. It was a, ben, it was a friend of Ben Affleck. And then and 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 Ben, I mean uh, Basil or whatever his name is, he was like, yeah, he said, um, so you got the new guy who's the driver, and you're like, yeah, he's a fellow too, but don't tell nobody. And so and they didn't, and you know, it got to the movie. So uh, I thought that was really funny. Um, he just said it was such a fun, it's such a fun movie, such a serious movie. Um, yeah, I, I, just, I just think it's it's really fun, and it's the movie I remember most from my formative years, like. I think I was going right into high school during this time, so I was pretty young, and this movie really stuck out to me at the time, and it still does. And I mean, it's left its mark. So, yeah, the, the, the town is, is is this high up for a reason. I really love that movie. Yeah, I love it too. I think I think it's still Affleck's best movie. Some people say Gone Baby Gone, but I don't think so. I think Gone Baby Gone is maybe like second or third, but I think the town is like solid number one, and it's an amazing movie. So I agree. Absolutely. Um, oh, at first when you were talking about the producer person, I thought it was going to be a lady. But there's another podcast I listen to where a lady who produced the town and movie, and I think she also works with that guy you mentioned. Uh, and, and she also produced John Wick and Sicario and all those movies too. So. His story was so interesting. But it was name of um, Basil Iwani. He was a, he was supposed to play basketball at Villanova and in, uh, in Philly or like in Philadelphia rather, yeah. uh, or Pennsylvania. And um, <laughs> he was in college, and then he was like, you know, I don't I want to produce movies. So he just drove to L.A. and started working on, like, uh, movie sets. No, like, uh, m- music uh, sets. So, like, uh, music, what is it called? Music video sets. Mm-hmm. And he worked his way up into, like, Universal and places like that. I, don't know. I thought his story was really uh, interesting. He talked about what a producer does, how they have uh, multiple things that they do and handle, and, and, and different producers do different things. It's a really interesting listen on the uh, Ryan Russillo pod. I, Encourage anybody to listen to it, but yeah, that's it. Can you hear me? I hear you, yeah. Okay. Um, that was your number seven? That was my seven, yeah. Okay. My number seven is The Handmaiden from 2016, Part and Whoop. Um, <clears throat> I don't want to give nothing away, so I won't. I'm just going to say it's a, it's like a psychosexual romance about um, like love triangle between two women and a man set Set, it's like maybe set in the Victorian, not Victorian era, but maybe set like in the 19th century in a in a Korea, and it's beautiful. It's like really elegant design, but also very violent and very sexually explicit. I mean, there's a whole there's a whole not subplot. Yeah, there's a subplot. There's a whole subplot in the movie where one of the main girls 
is uh, forced to read erotica for rich men. And she and she acts out the erotica. She doesn't get naked or anything, but she like has puppets. She acts it out as she reads it, and it's very like BDSM type stuff. And there's this, you know, I, I listen to the score all the time. I think the music is amazing. I think it's Park Chan Wook's best movie, and that's saying a lot because I think he's one of our one of the great filmmakers of all time. Um, and yeah, great twist. It's very long, but it feels epic. It doesn't. You don't feel the length. There's a there's, there's, tw there's a couple twists in it that I would never give away that are pretty amazing, and. uh you don't see coming, but are very fun. Like the old boy remake by Spike. I like that movie. Fuck it. Look, Spike don't make bad movies, as far as I'm concerned. So, um, but yeah, I love, love, love the Handmaiden. Love the style of it. Love the look of it. Love how romantic it is. Again, and I love um, I love the music. I love the costumes. I love the acting. And I love the ending. Very strange ending, very funny, but also like also again sexually explicit. Anyway, check it out. So, uh, what's your number six? My number six is Wolf of Wall Street. Great movie. Um, I don't like the conversations had around this talk about capitalism. I think it's an excuse to not uh, never mind. But uh, <laughs> but but this movie, <laughs> it's um, the conversations had around it at the time and why people love it so much um you know became very bastardized in terms of uh what the movie's about and what people like about it i do think there is a segment of the population that likes the debauchery and all that love and, and and that part of it is fun but i think the most memorable scene of the whole thing is the end when he's talking about selling the pen and it pans to the crowd and you're still watching you still watched all of this and you will continue to watch it because you glorify this mess. Um, and I think that's what it's trying to say. And, and shame on anybody who would think Scorsese would be a shallow to just make a movie just because. You know, I, I think that's incredibly irresponsible of people to to have had that opinion at the time. Maybe that's changed now. But you still see some of it. I still see some of it where, you know, you got uppity people thinking like, oh, well, it just glorifies. Like, of course it doesn't. You know, Scorsese doesn't. And he wouldn't do that. And obviously there's a deeper meaning. But beyond all of that, which makes the movie next level in terms of what it's trying to say, and it does it masterfully, it's such a fun movie. The music is great. It's a little long, but, I mean, it's fine. M movies are long, you know. A, a, a lot of the, the, the great ones are, and that don't mean it has to be long to be great, but, you know, it's fun. It's vibrant. It's live. Um, great performances from Jonah Hill, Leo, um, John Bernthal, all of, all of the main people. Um, Margot Robbie's breakout role, you know, what can you say about Wolf of Wall Street that hasn't been said already? Uh, I think it's one of Scorsese's best movies. Uh, certainly one of his best in his late stage. Um, and yeah, it came at the right time. It came at a time when those conversations were going to take off. And um, as much as those conversations annoy me, uh, I do think that this movie does a better job at trying to say what those people want to say but can't really articulate it because they're so agenda driven. And this movie kind of gives a detailed nuanced answer or um, set up to that question in terms of uh, what's happening here, even if it doesn't necessarily answer it. Um, I don't, I don't think you need to, I think the movie does enough and you can come to your own conclusion uh, based on what it's trying to say. But if you think it's just about fun and partying too, Hey, whatever it's not, but Hey, that's incredibly fun. And I get why somebody would just gleam that from it, but when you notice all of the other things it has under it, it makes it one of the best movies of the decade to me. So, mm -hmm. also one of the most entertaining too. One of the most entertaining movies I've ever seen in my life. It's so it's so good. It it flows so well and the pacing is so great. It's so well made. Yeah, Leo was just hilarious in it, and it's just like so good. John, how, how right? people come from that being like, oh, it's just a, it's glorified. Like how, bro? Like how, bro? Because it's so entertaining. They're like, I had so much fun. But I think that movie's reputation has grown in recent years, you know, because like at the time people are like, yeah, Wolf of Wall Street's good, but American Hustle is really how you do this kind of movie. And now people are like, that movie fucking sucks. And it, yeah. uh, American Hustle sucks, but uh, you know, yeah, no, nah, nah, it sucks. Um, and I think you know, Wolf of Wall Street has only gained in reputation in the years since. So. Okay, um, my number six is. Much like um, 
much like loving and little women i just i just kind of watch i just put on all the time i think it's i wouldn't say it's, i wouldn't say it's perfect in the same way that like the handmaid's perfect because the handmaid's like perfectly crafted but my number six is cloud cecilia maria and it just means a lot to me it's my it has two of my favorite performances of the past 10 years julia julia the notion leap this man this man eating ice what's going on so what no i was holding up a bag okay and uh my and kristen stewart and what i think is my favorite kristen stewart performance and one of the great performances period right um if you haven't seen cloud Sils maria it's wonderful it's about you know it's about aging it's about it's about you know performance and acting it's about you know roles repeating it's about you know who who holds the power in relationships it's fascinating um, honestly, if you just took the bits of the movie where it's Juliette Binoche and Kristen Stewart at their house, at their villa in the mountains, crack running lines for her play, like help, she was helping her practice her play, that is some of the best work. Is this the one by Oliver Assayas? Olivier Assayas, yeah. I have, I have Personal Shopper in the, top, in the bottom 50, like in the top 100. It, it didn't make the top 50. And I love Personal Shopper too, and that's more of a horror story. But it's not it's not scary. It's just kind of about ghosts and about like, you know, about like repression and like, you know, be, feeling left behind and like being stuck in a rut in your life and, you know, being still and but still grieving over people you've lost in your life. Um, whereas Cloud Seals Maria is about like the fear of youth and like the kind of like the, the fear of like becoming becoming irrelevant in a world that no longer desires you. And then, but then also placing that within like an environment of like extreme beauty, where it's like this is constant and this is forever, and it, and it matters always. I mean, th- I mean the writing is amazing, but like the way Kristen Stewart, the movie starts with Kristen Stewart on the phone, and like the way she, the way she communicates, the way uh, the themes of the story, where like a work, a work of art means something differently the more you age and the more you go through. So like you know, the major conflict of the movie is. Major conflict of the movie is um, that Julia Binoche played a role when she was like 19, 20 in a play, and now that she's in her 40s, 50s, they want her to play the role opposite of that. So like, you know, when she was 20, she played against a woman who was 50, 40, and now she's playing a 50, 40 role, and she doesn't know how to come to terms with like, I'm aging, and I always want to be the character that I was when I was 20. I want to be that character in the play. I don't want to be the old woman who's sad and bitter and alone. And Kristen Stewart is trying to tell her like, no, like you have changed now. Like the play means something different now than it was then. You know, when you were 20, that woman was old and bitter and sad. But now that you're this woman's age, think of it in that way. Think about what does she mean now? You know, does this role represent the same thing? And if it does, and if it does or if it doesn't, how can you engage with it in a separate way? And that it's a really smart movie about like work and art and experience and all these things. But also it's like weirdly dreamlike in that it's like, you know, kind of like people wrap around each other and kind of orient themselves in different positions. It's never explicitly like supernatural, but the movie feels like it is. Cloud Silver Maria does. Because, um, you know, like the movie starts with. I don't know. It, it, it's I, I can't explain it. It's like a movie that I watch and I just love all the time. And every time I see it, I see new things in it. But I can't explain like what is so brilliant about it. But watch it, you know, because it's perfect. It's wonderful. All right, well, what's your top five? Nate, we in the top five. We in the top five, and I want to say before we start this, Black Klansman, I did not forget you. If, Like I said, if I did a 21 through 25, I would probably bump some because I forgot about Black Klansman, and I would definitely put that in there. Uh, I, I felt bad for not having it in here. It's definitely one of my favorite movies of the decade, but it's just so few spots, you know, so. Oh, uh, but, so, okay, we're in the top five. My number five is Get Out. Great. It came around at the perfect time, you know, it's, you know, it, it came right when, like, those conversations about those things were happening rapidly, and it kind of said everything you needed to say about that topic, uh, put Jordan Peele on the map in terms of who he's going to be in the film world moving forward, and he's more than just what he had been for the years before. He completely course-corrected and changed his career, and I ain't saying, like, of course, right there, you know, saying that it was bad, but he just completely seen in a new light now. And it it happened like almost instantly with this movie. And I remember 
leading up to this movie and the time right before it and then going to see it with that pet crowd and how and how much it resonated and how much people were talking about it and movies weren't being really talked about about like that at the you know movie like in our time period right now that movie kind of dominated the social you know conversation and you just don't really see that no more and it really touched the pulse and uh it introduced me to daniel kaluuya which is is my favorite actor doing it right now i watch anything he's in uh Lil Rel got a big, you know, push from this. Uh, super smart, super witty. Everything about it was just, it was great, and it 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 kind of, it kind of gave horror. I'm not saying a jolt like it needed one, but it kind of took horror in a new direction. Like, okay, what are we trying to say now? Where this generation of horror movies will be based on what Get Out was, the social horror, the you know, uh, horror that's more about how people see you and perceive you than like a monster hiding in the bed, hiding under the bed. And that started with Get Out, kind of. So, uh, you can say it started with the Babadook, but Get Out was like the main stage, mainstream version of that on the biggest stage. So, Get Out is super influential. It might be the most influential movie of the decade, to be honest. Uh, at least one of them. So, they have to make my top five. Cool. Um, my top five is pretty set. All movies are, I mean, these, these top five movies, I mean, hope, I don't say top 10, but top five in particular. I think these are amongst the best movies ever made ever. Um, so number five is look top ten is that look at classic classics is real. Um, the number five is a uh, Gone Girl. What is there to say? Probably I watch this movie all the time. I love it to death. It's perfectly made. It's so funny. There's an argument to be made that it's Fincher's best movie, even though I put it as his second best movie. It's Absolutely, uh, when 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 change a thing, love everything about it. You say Gone Girl, right? Yep, Gone Girl at five. Let me say twenty fourteen. What's your four? My four is ooh, I think I'm gonna make a switch. I don't know. I'm putting the social network here. It was three, but I'm putting the social network here. Uh, it's, it's the it's too low. <laughs> I don't think so. It's the movie of the decade. It 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 symbolizes the decade. It symbolizes everything that the decade will come to be. The and the technology age and the digital age and you know uh, us coming but be, become becoming less connected to one another and that being both a good thing and a terrible thing depending on how you look at it and uh, you know it began it, it it started the decade off with a bang with Fincher and uh, Sorkin coming together for the first time and I think Scott Rudin was the producer it was masterfully put together the cast was wonderful everything down to the accuracy, but then we'll come later to find that maybe it isn't as accurate as we thought. Uh, but if you depend on the narrator to tell you that, then, you know, it depends on, on if you think Mark Zuckerberg is a competent narrator, even about his own life. I mean, I would say he's, you know, it probably wasn't as true as, you know, and he said as much, but, I mean, you know, it made for a good movie. Uh made for a great movie. Uh One of the better movies of, you know, of my life and uh, you know, it it, it kind of called everything that was about to happen. I always think about the scene when Sean Parker is in is in that room with the coke, and he's just talking about like what it would be. And I can't really remember the words to paraphrase at the moment, but but basically saying like, you know, this is what it'll be, and you talk to these people here, and you can connect with everybody all over the world, and how that could have been seen good at at the time, but then ten years removed, maybe that wasn't as good as we thought, and maybe. It had more complications than positives and maybe more negatives than we like to think. But that movie is masterful. The dialogue is masterful. The direction is poignant and it's pointed and it's uh and it's direct and it's solid and it's supposed and everything's supposed to be where it's supposed to be. Jesse Eisenberg uh, starts here and goes on to have an interesting career. Um, but this is his start and nobody could have done Mark Zuckerberg like he did. Andrew Garfield. Uh, what's her name? Uh one of the Mars, I think, is that Rooney or Kate? I think that's Rooney, right? Yeah, Rooney. And it introduces me to all these new people. Uh, Army Hammer, you know, it introduces you to so many people. And just Justin Timberlake giving a legitimately great performance. So uh, everything about that movie is damn near perfect. It's 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 almost perfect. And it represents this decade to a T, I must say that. Great. Love it. Um, oh wait, I should have said it. I know if you got it on there, right? Yeah, I definitely like, have it on there. Um, but it's all good. Uh, my number four is uh, Phantom Thread. 
2017 by Paul Thomas Anderson. Look, you know me, you know I love some Phantom Thrill. And if you know me, you know I love romance. And if you put thread and romance together, you get one of the best American movies ever. Um, it's so funny. It's so well written. It's so well acted. Vicky Creeps, Leslie Manville, Daniel Day Lewis. People, there are people who don't like this movie. And those people, I know exactly who you are if you don't like Phantom Thrill. <laughs> and it's just one of those things. It's like the kind of people who say the social network is overrated, but they still like it. I know exactly who you are, and we don't need to talk no more. But same with Phantom Thread. It's wonderful. People, people may say it's boring. People may say nothing happens. But this is what I'll say to them. Go watch your capes and your spandex and leave me alone. I don't want to hear from you. Um, I love it. I love everything about it. Ending's perfect. The music is uh, next level. It's just uh, not a wrong step. That's why I, I, the, the, the worst thing about it is, much like uh, another film on this list, it's so good that I'm almost certain that the next PTA movie will disappoint me. That's how good it is. Anyway. And that's how I think people will feel, too. Anyway, that's all. Um, what's your number three? I don't agree with the one I had at four, but I switched the master. Great movie. Love it. Uh, you obviously have this on there, too, right? It's in what? It's a, uh, what number is it? It's 24 on my top 50. Gotcha. Um, a movie that's basically telling you uh, to find your master in life. Otherwise, you go to find something. Otherwise, you go through life with no purpose. And then you result, come to realize, watch a movie, you're your own master. You have to live your life for you. Can nobody else can do it except the most. I mean, your master is the most high, but on on this physical plane, you have to dictate your life. And it's a beautifully it's a it's a beautifully done movie. It's uh, it does so much with emotion. It does so much with men and how they uh, can be there for one another. But also, uh, you can use someone if they, if they don't know who they are. You can definitely um, abuse them and uh, and, and manipulate them. Uh, I love PTA because he really puts a focus on men and uh, and and what they go through in terms of like who they're trying to be and who they want to be, and you know and, and how they go about this world and a world that tells them kind of what to be like as it does for everybody. But you know uh, it, it can get swept to the wayside a little bit. And he kind of puts a mirror to that almost, uh, but also holding them still accountable for themselves, which is what we all should be. And the master is basically holding you accountable. It's a movie that holds you accountable. It tells you you have to you you have to be the master of your life. It can be nobody else. And if your life is going to be just you laying on a beach all day, and then you know <laughs> you you gotta find it. Like, but if that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do. I love how it's bookmarked with that, like Freddie Quill on the beach at the beginning and the end, and how everything he went through, he ended up right where he was because overall it has to be in you. Otherwise, it's not gonna work. You have to find that motivation. And, uh, and just great performances from everybody, but most importantly, the late, great Philip Seymour Hoffman, given his, I think his last one with PTA, or is that his last one in general? No, he was making movies after that. He was in the Hunger Games movies. Um, but no, oh, yeah. that was, was the last that? one. That was the last one PTA, yeah. That was the last one PTA, but just embodying L. Ron Hubbard so well as Lancaster died, and uh, obviously Joaquin Phoenix is, um, as uh, Freddie Quayle being lost uh and so primal and so instinctive but you know j just uh nothing behind the eyes until it's time for him to feel something and that last scene with with, with lancaster died and he he cries because you know that that time is up because ultimately he has to go do what he has to do because he is his own master even if he's so far removed from really being in control of his own life he knows enough to know that um he can't go on just being on the hip of Lancaster died because that's not what he truly wants. And that's not who he truly is. You know, uh, he's an animal at the end of the day. And uh, he's, he has to be in the wild until he figures it out for himself. And it's a beautiful movie. It's, it's, it's PTA's best to me. Uh, I, I absolutely adore that movie. And that's why it's number three. Great pick. Great pick. I saw someone uh, online, they said something that was like, you ever feel like uh, Freddie Quill just walking in between a, a wall and a window? I was like, ah, oh, that's funny. I'm like, no. You know, just stuck in a rut. I think that's the point. Like, not able to get what you want out of it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I love that movie. 
wonderful. Love it more. Uh, love it more every time I see it. Okay, so like I said, fan thread. I also agree about this with my number three, which is it's so good that I think it made people think the follow-up was worse than what it was, which is Green Room 2016. Okay, Green Room is the best horror movie of the past 10 years. It's not close. Ain't nothing touching oh. it. Not Hereditary, not oh. Miss Mar, not The Babadook. It shits on all of them. It's not a horror movie. Definitely a horror movie. And Green Room is so great that people think Hold the Dark is not a good movie, which is wrong. Hold the Dark is a masterpiece. Maybe not a masterpiece. About Jeremy Sonier? Yeah, by the great Jeremy Sonier. Hold the Dark, fucking rules. I love it. And it didn't make my top 100, but... You know, who knows? Maybe in some time. But Green Room is wonderful. It's it's hyper violent. It's hyper tense. It's a movie that I think that every choice made was the correct choice that could not be improved upon. There are choices in that movie where like when they happen, I vibrate because I'm like, this is the right thing to do. There's no way to do this any better. And I and I, it's such a perfect movie. Top to bottom. So tight. Ends exactly where it needs to. Begins exactly where it needs to. Waste no time. So deeply disturbing and also like funny and like heartfelt and you know great action. It's just such a good movie, man. And you know has so many. Look, I firmly believe Green Room was a precursor to the uh, Trump era. You know that movie came out 2016 and premiered 2015, and then like Trump wins and then all of a sudden there's Nazis marching in Charlottesville and you got people talking about you know Proud Boys out in public you know proclaiming stuff. So that movie was pressing in a, in a big way, and I just love it. I think it is perfect. And has, has you know, Imogen Poots um, and Anton Yelchin give two performances that should have been Oscar nominated, probably should have won, but because of, you know, the genre it was in, it just didn't. Also, it came out at a time when, like, 824, like, it was right after Room, but before Moonlight. So it was before they were, like, the biggest, like, a big independent label so they kind of got it kind of got overlooked based on when it came out and where it was like most violent year had that too where it's like that's an h24 movie but people don't even think of it when they think about the best h24 movies because it didn't come out post that moonlight like wave of them and you know when people talk about h24 they be like well, hereditary it's just the blah 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 hereditary is fine it's no green room it's not nearly as disturbing green room is perfect and it's a uh, third best movie of the last 10 years all right what's your number two one of the two should be no surprise, maybe a little surprise, Parasite. It's real high. Great movie, though. Parasite is perfect. It's perfect. There's nothing wrong with it. The ending is amazing. And I've waxed poetic about this movie before, so I won't do too long. The performances are amazing. The script is amazing. It balances the perfect line between funny and serious on a dime. You can tell the exact switch of the movie from the first half to the second half if you watch correctly. Uh, all of the clues, all of the details, all of the signs, all of the symbolism, everything's perfect. The music, the sequencing, the exact use of uh, slow-mo, the exact use of montage, the uh, all of the dialogue is funny, witty, snappy. It's great. Everything is great. It's the best movie of the decade. And it's number two. Mm. If that makes sense to you. No, I get you. That's a great movie. Um, yeah, no doubt. Did you have it on the 100? I did not. Well, I know who I'm talking to. <laughs> I, was thinking, I was like, I ain't got no bomb on this 100? That's crazy. Uh, but I, I like Oakjaw more than I like uh, Parasite. But uh, Parasite's great. No doubt, that's wrong. That's wrong. <laughs> no doubt about it. Um, uh, number two is a pure experience. I love it. I put everybody on it. Everybody I've shown it to seems to like it. Same fan thread as well. People seem to like that movie too. Uh, but Spring Breakers, number two, 2013, Harmony Corinne. Spring Breakers. It's on TV all the time. On Showtime, and every time it's on, I just turn it on for a few minutes and be like, "Yep, still great." And then I go to something else because it's wonderful. The first time I saw Spring Breakers, I was like, "This is garbage. I don't like it." And then I didn't think about it for years. And then one night it was on Showtime, so I turned it on, 
And I was like, oh, that's a lot better than I remember. And then every night, every night it would come on. I'd watch it over and over and over again. And then I watched it like 30 times. And I was like, well, I guess I like this more than I remember. I guess it might be the best movie of the decade, possibly. Um, but yeah, top to bottom. It's a movie that like, you know, characters aren't super deep. They're kind of archetypes. They kind of represent this and that. But I think the performances do exactly what they need to do. They're properly frightening and properly funny and properly like virtuous and this, that, and the other. And then Gucci Mane is in it, and he's an awful actor. But even he is, he works for the movie. I don't know how, how they do it. It's perfect. It's beautiful. It's nothing else is like it, man. I don't know. Nothing else. Yeah. What's your number one, Nate? What's the big, what's numero uno? <laughs> my number one movie of the decade and maybe of my short life is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Wow. So, so over Parasite, huh? Parasite is the best movie of the decade. Once Upon a Time might be my favorite movie ever. That's crazy. That's pretty high. It's, a, it's everything in a movie I want. Crazy. It's everything I want. Mm-hmm. I watched it twice in the theater, and both times I was like, I want to live in this world. I would go back to that 60s time period when they were probably calling niggas nigger on the street. Yo. Yo. You know what? It was fun. Yeah, I don't think it was. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this guy said, look, they call us niggers, and you know what? Maybe we should be called that. I'm like, uh, I don't know. Are we acting like no? Uh, <laughs> uh. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there's anything to be said. Uh, really, Parasite and Once Upon a Time are like one A, one B, but I had to put one. I had to put something in one, and I put Once Upon a Time Hollywood because it's it's a movie about movies. It's a movie with movie stars. It's a movie with people driving around. It's a great soundtrack. It's 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 well done. It's it's a movie about movies, and it's a movie about movies with a TV show episode in the movie. And an actor working on dialogue and a stuntman and it's it's literally everything I ever wanted. And I knew it was going to be when I first heard about it. And then when I got it, I was like, yeah, yeah, he did it. He did what I wanted. QT remade this world for me. And I think about that one scene uh, when they're playing Out of Time by the Rolling Stones and all of the signs are coming on. And that Out of Time sequence is so important because it's not just Out of Time about... Uh, it's out of time for Sharon Stone because her friend comes over. She's like, you're going to make a great mother. And she's like, thank you. It's out of time for her. It's out of time for old Hollywood. It's out of time for Rick Dalton and uh, Cliff Booth and their friendship. It's out of time for this world, for this period of life. Because when Sharon Tate dies, like the world or Hollywood especially gets kind of morbid and it never quite gets back to that time before because you lose somebody like her. In the manner that it happened, it's it out of time for innocence. It's out of time for all of that. And it happens in the late 60s into the 70s. Then you get the new age of Hollywood right into the 70s. And, you know, and it kind of starts with Bonnie and Clyde like in 69. You get all of those things. It happens right there. That out of time sequence is the beginning of the end for all of it. And then he changes it and shows us what would have happened if it didn't happen. And maybe the world and Hollywood specifically might be different. And, you know, it's it's perfect. It's amazing. It's fun. It's weighty. It's it's heavy, but it's also light. It's everything. And it's funny. And it's it's QT at his best. I think this is the best movie ever. Um, it's one of my favorite movies of all time. It's one of the best movies of all time. My top movie of the decade is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And I don't care what you say. Great movie. Great movie. I need to read yeah, it. Yeah, okay. yeah, whatever. Uh, my number one is uh, season three, episode nine and ten of Halt and Catch Fire. So let's, let's delve into it. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm gonna turn it off. <laughs> hey, it's, feature, it's feature length. It's feature length. No, no, no. What? It's feature length. It's you know two two forty five minutes episodes make an hour and a half, baby. It's a fucking movie. I'm getting mad. <laughs> okay, number one is the Social Network. Even though yeah, Halt and Catch Fire is the best thing of the day. I was getting really mad. <laughs> the Social Network, number one, most entertaining movie of the decade, best written movie of the decade, best directed movie of the decade, best X movie of the decade, 
that's twisted movie decade and Citizen Kane of our generation ain't nothing better and it ever been better. I've seen it. The, 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 let me tell you the story about how I first watched it. I got the DVD on Christmas Day 20, 2010, right? It's midnight 2010. It's, 20, it's, it's, it's 2010, December 26, midnight. I'm like, I'm going to pop it in and watch the few first few minutes. Watch the whole thing, 2 in the morning. I went to sleep, woke up the next day around 8, just so I, I got up early, just so I could watch Hulk at, just like I watched the social network again. I watched it four times a day. I didn't watch nothing else. I didn't play no games. I didn't do nothing. I watched social network four times in one day, back to back to back. Then the next day I watched it three more times. And the next day I watched it two more times. And I took a break. And then I watch it every time I can because it's perfect. I've never, I, that movie blew my mind. I was 15 years old and I was like, yo, I ain't no movies can do this, bro. I was like, I'm hyped on the town, really. I should be hyped on the greatest movie ever made, and that is The Social Network. Everyone, oh, yeah. the greatest movie ever made, The Social Network. Oh, yeah. And you know what I'm saying? Like, well, what can you say? It's perfect. You know what I'm saying? Every it's, it's perfectly shot. It's perfectly paced. You know what I'm saying? The opening stuff with the face mask is great. The opening scene with Eric Albright is great. It's all great. You know what I'm saying? It just all works. And it's it has thematic depth. It has like you know technical craft on display, and it has just pure entertaining thrill on top of it. It's just so funny. It's such a compelling drama. It's perfect. Nothing else is better, ever. The only thing that comes close is Spring Breakers. Sorry to say, guys, that's not true. It might be true. Um, uh, at least this decade, Spring Breakers is the only thing that comes close. But you know, Social Network number one, Spider Man two number two, and the rest is the rest in terms of filming. Um, and that's it. What is it? We did it. I want to give a special shout out to Widows. Dave Kaluuya again, my favorite actor right now. The best actor right now. Say that. I was like, I was going to put Widows in my top 50. It's in my top 100. But I was like, nah, 12 Years a Slave got to go in the top 50. Widows going 12 Years a Slave ain't better than Widows. I ain't seen it. Yo, you got to watch. 12 Years a Slave is fucking perfect. Um, it's a, it's a masterpiece. Sell them on that next. Get out of here, man. I, th- I think Twenty Years Slave is still McQueen's best joint, but then again, I ain't seen his new. I ain't seen all Small X, so maybe I'll watch Lovers Rock and be like, "Nah, this is the one." Or uh, Mangrove, who knows? Might be his best TV show. That's, those are series of movies, my guy. You can't uh, you, can, you can't tell me uh, Black Blue or whatever that one's called with John Boyega ain't a movie. I can tell you something that's Fifty Eight Minutes ain't no movie, and I'm saying Fifty Eight Minutes, bro. That movie I don't have. Mangrove and all, some of those are like Fifty Eight. Mangrove, Mangrove is two hours. Mangrove is two hours. One of those is 58 minutes. It's not a movie. It's a short film. No, it's not. Man, you tripping, bro. You just being a bigot. Okay. You being a snob and a gatekeeper. Okay. I'll beat it. I'll beat it. I'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll be a gatekeeper. No biggie. But, uh, yeah, this, this was great. It was a great decade. And uh, this year sucked. But hopefully next year's better. Or maybe not. I, I like a lot, I like a lot of movies from this year, bro. And that's still so many I haven't seen yet. Maybe not because the theater's probably gonna be gone. So this decade probably gonna be a wash anyway. So fuck yeah. it. Look, look, Nate. You gotta think how I feel. I watched Home Catch Fire. It ended in 2017, and I still gotta watch new TV. I'm like, ain't nothing gonna compare to this. It's all downhill from here. That show <laughs> sucked when it came out. Yeah, I, I watch every time I watch that show. I'm like, yo, bro, why am I watching anything else but Home Catch Fire? I I really be feeling like that. I put on an episode. I'm like, I remember one night. That way about succession. Not I, it, was I, 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 it was one night, like a couple weeks ago. I'm like, I'm gonna watch one episode of Home Catch Fire. I watched four episodes. I was like, I'm gonna watch. It was like ten. I'm like, I'm gonna watch one. Go to bed at eleven. I went to bed at like three in the morning. And I was like, I really can't do this to myself. One, two. I'm like, this show is so good. Why do I even care about anything else? I'll just keep watching this over and over again because nothing else really comes close, except like you know, Mad Men comes close. That's the only thing. And Mad Men ain't on Netflix no more, so I can't even just put on Netflix. Yes, bro. I might have to go ahead and cop that box set and stop playing. Uh, Mad Men Complete Series, you know what I'm saying? Don't do it, seriously. I'm definitely going to do it. Cause what, I'm going to sign up at AMC Plus just to watch Mad Men? No. They got an AMC Plus? It's fine. That's why they took it off Netflix. AMC was like, we got our own streaming service. We want Mad Men back. And they're like, all right. Well, we get to keep breaking back because we uh, co-produced it. And they're like, fine. Fine. But, you know. Oh, we did it. Jazz, what's your favorite? Top 10 of the decade. Go. <laughs> she was just like, no. 
You know, like, uh, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, oh, he trying to do you. He trying to do you. He said you like trash. I like Guardians of the Galaxy. What is wrong with that? Oh, you're trying to go, huh? All right. She said I ain't going to be at the top, nigger. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she said Rugrats <laughs> Rugrats in Paris that was the last day <laughs> that's a good one though like, yeah it is yeah I almost forgot to um, that's hilarious m- remember in the first one you got that peanut butter boy that was hey you crying in there, huh? yeah. I'm gonna put Sausage Party on my list that's a Sausage Party um, great movie it's alright this is the end. I like that was on your list because I love that movie. Yeah. I completely yeah. forgot about it. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a great one. You gotta put on some. Uh, I put on no. Um... You know what I got? I need to see King of Staten Island. I still ain't seen that, and I really, mm-hmm. really want to. I'm surprised you put Molly's Game. You talking to me? Yeah. Man, that's a good movie. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> You love that movie. This man said it's a project for Molly's game. What the fuck you mean? You love that movie. You got me fucked up. Come on, Molly again. They're going to be like, you, why don't you put on Miss Sloan? I'm like, look, I like Miss Sloan a lot. I'm going to put on my top 50. All right. Thank you guys for dealing with us in our top 28 uh, of the year, a decade, rather, century. I think, it was, um, I think it was more than that, but okay. Appreciate you listening. Um, and once again, hold the place or your place will be taken. Just place on the podcast, baby. See how that's how you do it.